we, we're, I think we're, this is a recipe for disaster, but very good content. Let's fucking do yeah, it. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely perfect. Hello everyone and welcome back to Set 6 and today what we've got for you is the next episode of the Big 7 which is obviously the mega hit series where we get your favourite Final Fantasy 7 creators and we ask them 7 questions. Now I'm sure you can see, well other way, this guy over here, you know, uh, yeah, you, you mate, you. So oh, God. this is my guest this week, the absolute theory crafting machine, the mighty sleep easy. So would you like to introduce yourself and tell everyone what it is you're up to, what you've been doing? and where they can find you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, hello, and thank you for having me. Oh, first no, it's a pleasure. The pleasure's all I've mine. Been, <laughs> I've been dying to do this ever since I saw the first one. So I was, I was, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I am Sleep Easy. I have a YouTube channel where we talk about Final Fantasy VII theory content through compilation stuff and how it all pertains to remake and vice versa. Uh, if you want to watch... I don't know, uh, probably, I can't remember. I, I used to have the number of how many hours each video was. Oh God. I don't have that many on my channel, but... When numbers get like, so high, well, you lose track of them, don't you? It's it's insane. But uh, the, <laughs> uh, if you guys want a long-form theory, giant, like, iceberg discussions of content <laughs> for Final <laughs> Fantasy VII uh, theory crafting, uh, you can check me out on Sleep Easy on YouTube. Just type me in. I'll be there. I'm a frog. You can find me <laughs> here I'm somewhere frog. where this frog yeah, is the, located. The majestic frog. Uh, yeah, I also uh, do Twitch. Uh, I stream Final Fantasy VII Remake, the compilation, uh, and other things. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, Delta Rune because that's that yes. uh, recently announced. I saw uh, your excitement things. over this yesterday. <laughs> I was very, I was very stoked. I, I love that game. That's like a, that's a hot chocolate sort of, sort of game for me, where you can just sit back and just relax. Comfort. So, yeah, yeah. If you are interested in any of that, just uh, you can find me there on YouTube. So, and all of the links. Make sure that, but well, you should see them floating underneath Sleep Easy right about now. But they will also be in the description. So make sure that you get over there, give you support, drop a like, follow everything. Because, yeah, why not? Don't cost you anything. Why not? No. <laughs> now, 99 cents per, per subscriber. Yes. <laughs> Love it. Don't look at the fine print. No, it's no, free. don't. never read the fine print. Never read oh. the fine print. There's nothing oh. sneaky in the fine print whatsoever. The, Shinra, the Shinra Business Academy. <laughs> yeah, there's a Shinra logo on the bottom right. If you get your microscope out. Oh, I love it. Now, also, don't forget to drop a like on this video and subscribe to the channel. We've got, I think there's eight of these episodes out already now and plenty more to come, so keep an eye on them. But let's get straight into the questions. So, the first one, we start off nice and easy. We start off nice and easy. So, what was your first experience with Final Fantasy VII? How were you introduced to the game or the compilation, whichever way around it was? I was actually uh, introduced... I was introduced to just most of my rpgs through other people and and family members yeah. specifically uh final fantasy 7 i became aware of just final fantasy in general uh but my first one viewing final fantasy 7 the original was at my cousin's uh house my yeah. sorry to be more specific my aunt's boyfriend's uh house in his kid's room Right. And they were playing it in the back corner of one of the rooms that they had. And it was like four teenagers, like grouped around. And some of the younger Look kids, they were all older than, than I was. And I was like, I had never seen anything quite like it. So, and we were, you know, that, those were the days where maybe I, I might run out and play outside or play, <laughs> like do some physical activity. Maybe touch some grass. <laughs> ran, yeah, baby. And I just, uh, I ended up watching that for quite a bit of time. And my cousins also introduced me to uh, to Final Fantasy VIII and uh, Legend of Dragoon. And yes. then my brother uh, was a big Chrono Cross fan. So the uh, PS1 and, classics then, really. Yeah. 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 A lot of good, a lot of good stuff came through through them so uh my i didn't really have much of an experience playing it until later but having i i at that point i had familiarized myself with yeah. like the story and everything like that so so when was the first time that you played it then did you just go out and buy it it wasn't so like actually, back then you got your hands on it or anything like that i and this is going to be a, an interesting discussion in, in terms of like how 
people might perceive like my experience of RPGs in general, but my first experience playing it was watching my brother play it after seeing my cousins play it. Yeah. It was like, oh, okay, we want that. Like I want to <laughs> yes. play whatever they're playing. And I didn't have much of a stomach for the RPGs. So I was sort of, we were sort of like passing the controller. Taking it in turn, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it was it was quite an interesting experience, especially because I hadn't really experienced a game with that kind of scope before in terms of like storytelling. Yeah. And I just enjoyed the characters and yeah. I enjoyed the, the whole concept of like the live stream and all of that other stuff. It was a very, and obviously like cloud sort of journey and all this. Uh, it was very interesting. And I, I, I will actually say that it's probably the only RPG that I sat down and played with my brother because from yeah. that point on, other than like maybe Super Mario RPG, I kind of just became more <laughs> of a passive viewer of them because I just didn't have much of a patience for like yeah. the, the combat systems or anything like that. So not a fan Obviously, of like the turn based. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Weren't yeah. a fan so much of like the turn based gameplay and things like that. Yeah, it was like a jump though because for me, like it was very similar for me when I first got onto Seven because like all of the games I played were either like platformers, uh, sports games, things like that. So it was literally my first ever JRPG. So it was like, oh, what's going on here? And it did take a bit of time for me to get used to it all. But no, it, I, I'm glad I did. I'm definitely glad I did. <laughs> and that was the other thing too is is that Final Fantasy Seven. I know that was very impactful to a lot of people. Like for me like i can point to other rpgs that i think me and my brother were more interested in yeah like even like xenosaga which is another series yep. that he played through um i it was just those when i think back to like those early days i don't really think of how final fan i think about how final fantasy 7 impacts me now more yeah. uh, in my old like these these times the present day yeah yeah, yeah. whereas i think then. about like Chrono Cross, because Chrono Cross for me was like, this game looks beautiful. This story is extremely engaging uh, to me at the time. And it was a game that my brother would play over and over again. So, like, that one is way more burned into my. See, I've never finished Chrono, Chrono Cross. I played it, I, I, it just didn't grab me that much. And then, like, at the same time, there was other games like Breath of Fire 3 and stuff like that that I was really getting into on PlayStation. So I kind of lent that way a lot more and just kind of forgot about Chrono Cross. I, don't, I should probably give it a download and, you know. Honestly, <laughs> I've heard other people's opinion about it at this point. And I, again, I didn't play it. I would just watch my brother play it. So I can't speak for anything as far as like how boring or not it was boring the story it is you were play. But for me, yeah. I was just like, oh, I love these characters. I love like links and like all of these, like, it's such a weird story. I, I thought the sword was cool, which is like a double-edged <laughs> like, sword. And I was like, this is sick. Um, yeah, so... But Final Fantasy, that's how I sort of became aware of, like, Final Fantasy in general. I didn't really know about the SNES titles at that point, yeah. really. Um, I, I started hearing more about them as time went on. Yeah. I yeah. think, like, six, obviously, and then just through YouTube, you'd sort of start to see these games that you sort of never, you know, some of them pass you by. Classics can pass you by. Oh, 100%. Uh, like, I didn't even know six and that like, existed. Uh, and I'm old. So, do you know, I was about when the SNES was dropping. I think we got Final Fantasy... Th I'm trying to think, did we get... I think we got Final Fantasy 3 over here, which was 6 on the SNES, mm -hmm. but it was a very limited amount, I think, and I, I never saw one. I, I've still, to this day, right. never seen never a seen physical cartridge. cartridge of it. Yeah, I um, feel like, because like a lot of my family, my extended family also had their own systems and their own you know games that they had i can remember seeing the cartridge for it yeah i never played it yeah i yeah. just remember seeing it and there was a lot of titles like that that i yeah look back on and i'm like and this is a weird thing because we live in a day and age where people are like you never played like xx oh and my S God. On a game. <laughs> like, Shut up. you, you <laughs> as, a, as a child a don't get to choose exactly and oh my god you just never hear about something until it's like way later only until people start talking about it and discussing it or especially with these like jrpgs it. and stuff like that because like back then in america you'd get them what like six months to a year after they'd come out in japan we were six months to a year after that so yeah. the, the way these games filtered out eventually we'd be getting them when the next one's out in some cases do you know what i mean it's like right. come on <laughs> 
<laughs> I think like nobody, nobody in my fucking inner circle understood what Secrets of Evermore were was. <laughs> like no one would have come up to me and been like, "Yo, dude, have, have you played, played this it? game?" Yeah. I'm like, I don't fucking know what you're talking about. I did play uh, Secret of Not Mana for a bit. I, yeah. it, the gameplay didn't really. Again, like I, I'm so stingy with that stuff. It wasn't until like. I hate to say it, but like my intro to like playing anything related to or even close to that was like uh, Kingdom Hearts, which yep. I don't think a lot of people know about me is that that's sort of like a series that I was attached to for a, quite a bit of time. It was the most impressionable to me. I never, so that never was kind of like, like your gateway like properly into JRPGs then at that right. point. That was kind of what brought you in. And that was also one of the reasons why I was so interested in Final Fantasy VII Remake as a game, because I was like, okay, well, like, rather than just enjoying the story from an outside perspective looking in or watching my brother play this or somebody else, Let's do it. like, I can play this game, yeah. and I think I will enjoy this and not be, like, bored or feel, yeah. like, stressed or irritated. Um, and it's it's so weird to think that, like... And I love it. I love the yeah. game. And I love I love that game. And I love Intergrade. Like, absolutely. Like, those games are fantastic to play. And so Still no PS5. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's okay. Hey, you know, honestly, I'll be honest. Like, I was very, like, I may be stressing a lot of, like, the importance of playing P the, the Intergrade. Oh, I just uh, watched Baby Seal. I, he spoiled yeah. everything for me, so I'm fine. Yeah, it's, it's already done. <laughs> the seal is broken yep that's it it's done i don't even need to play it now broken. yeah exactly <laughs> it, it is an interesting experience thinking only to sort of see as the stepping stone to whatever happens next yeah and that, that's exciting it's so. definitely a bridge in the gap kind of thing not just narratively but i think technologically as well like i think it was done specifically like right let's see how this works on ps5 let's see how we have to get things done like it, 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 on so right. many levels so many levels i'm sure that there was like a pipeline level of like okay let's familiarize ourselves yeah. with this a little bit more um but i i would almost say like and i use this comparison a lot and i don't know if people like understand it necessarily as much if you haven't played like kingdom hearts at all but like yeah. kingdom hearts feels terrible the first one like when you go back and play it like it's like the the like early workings of what that sort of style of game would be yeah that like, action 3d adventure yeah right in that it was like sort of setting that stage for yeah. kingdom hearts 2 when when you do play that game it does feel amazing. It feels, it feels much more refined. Good. Yeah, hundred percent. Right. It doesn't feel clunky, and I feel like that was the transition that I sort of sensed with intergrade to our intermission to the original. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's the same sort of transition as well. I'd say from Final Fantasy VII to Final Fantasy VIII, because Final Fantasy yeah. VII was that very first step into like the three D world, and you could see when they got to eight. Granted, it still had issues, but. The job that they did of that 3D world and all the mechanics that go into it was so much more, like I say, refined. I would I would think that, if anything, if the story goes off the rails for Final Fantasy VII Remake <laughs> at any point for people, I would say that the game... It will still be I fun. Of, yeah, I think the combat is really good. Once we get to that like last game, yeah. we're going to have one of the greatest like systems of all yeah, time. They're, they're going to add layers as we go through, 100%. Right. And yep. I think that's also good for people like me who it's like you want to evolve the system, I think. Yeah. And I think that's actually really important to the developers as well is sort of incorporating an element of the story with the gameplay. I, and yeah. like sometimes bigger and more like uh, I would say like more obvious aspects. It immerses you a lot more because you, there's not a break between the two. If the two kind of intermingle and weave into each other, it definitely immerses you and lets you get more into the game, I think, for sure. Yeah, 100%. And I, I think you can, especially with like a party system, I think that yeah. it's it's a it's a easy serve to sort of tell the story a little bit minorly through that. And I think that's sort of coming into play with how like unique and singular Yuffie feels as opposed to the party system of of this of the last game. Even <laughs> though I want I want the party system sort of feeling to to matter. Like I want to be switching to other characters. Well do you think uh, th that would be an interesting thing that they could bring into it as well, you know, that switching in mechanic. I, I, yes. I, I'm, I can't see why not. I, I think like. it would be I think it, it 
what what I always run into when I start talking about this is that I think a lot of people like the original remake system of like, okay, switch to different party members because you need to use them. Yes. And that's important to like keeping it interesting and fun and the variety of that. That like each situation sort of changes just it's the control aspect as well. You feel so much more in control as well. Because you're hopping right. between these characters and you know, you've got that you've got well control you've got that grasp over them they're doing what you want them to do whereas like in other games previously you'd be in control of your one character and i think it was 13 right, everybody else is sort of doing like doing their own thing else. yeah and sometimes the ai is questionable yeah 100 <laughs> they're yeah who knows when that's going to be uh, figured <laughs> out <laughs> Whenever, whenever AI becomes a thing, I think the day that happens, that the day the time. AI gets that good, is the day that the AI turns on us and kills us. I, I honestly yeah. think that that's the day. <laughs> all, all, all for the sake of uh, video gaming. Skynet. Yeah, Skynet. <laughs> Air, Skynet. That wouldn't be so crazy, would it? Maybe good AI and bad AI. It's getting you know, less crazy as time goes on. Like I, yeah. younger me, you'd be like, nah, that's not going to happen. Me now, like, mm, maybe. <laughs> it's like that could come up fucking tomorrow and i wouldn't be surprised <laughs> it's like any day now any day this shit is gonna see one of them out. smart fridge freezers just rolling down the street <laughs> yeah just like shooting <laughs> ice cubes at the person in front of them oh fuck yeah. you know. what a lie yeah. right well yeah. that, that tangent was only about 20 minutes we should be all right eh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, think, I think we're smooth sailing from here on out oh love it so i mean you touched on this one a little bit in the answer to the previous question but what would you say the biggest way that sevens influenced you is like what would you say the biggest influence it's had on your life in general i would say actually it would be more of the content creation yeah. approach i think uh i think what i what i touched on before as you mentioned i as a child i didn't really deeply connect like some people love like final fantasy 7 like they like star wars like it's a part of them it was a part of their childhood yeah. and it shaped that for them or like a sort of view of something uh yeah. for me it didn't have that level of impact but what i will say is, is that um remake came out at around the time that there was just a lot of stuff going on in my life in terms of just like the way that I was like living my life, yeah. like sort of directionless. I will say yes. like, I was like, I don't really know what I'm doing and I'm kind of just living day to day. I was like working two jobs and all this stuff. And I had previously had like moments before then where I had tried to kind of create certain things for myself and they had never really panned out. Yeah for one reason or another, or like it just never finished or whatever. Um, and I was just sitting there like one day, like watching uh, the, the sort of discussion that Maximilian dude was having about yeah. the game after finishing it. And uh, I was like, a, a, in my head, I was just like, uh, like, I get what you're saying. Like, I kept saying that to myself. Like, I get <laughs> where you're coming from. I understand. From. <laughs> I understand. I understand what you're throwing down here. And I think that it's good. And like making these connections is good. But the, the question that I keep thinking to myself is like, why? Yeah. And I had, I had thought about making a YouTube channel before uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake. I was actually thinking about doing one around the time that uh, Resident Evil VII uh, was, oh, yeah. uh, was a thing. I think at Resident Evil Seven, yeah, and uh, because there was a bunch of mystery surrounding that game, and yeah. there was a couple other ideas that I had tossed around, but like after I don't know what happened, but I think I had sort of decided to myself privately that if I was going to do that, yeah, this was the time to do it, yeah, and so I had sort of decided to myself that remake was the thing that i wanted to talk about like so overwhelmingly that why was i just trying to stop myself from talking about it like why not just fuel that energy into something that people can watch yeah turn it around than... make it positive right and i had in my mind already conceived the idea that this could work yeah. like i think that was the other thing is is that i was like final fantasy 7 remake is new a lot of people are talking about it i'm very passionate about it and I need to like produce something. So yeah. like, there's absolutely nothing stopping me other than myself. And I had just sort of 
I just did it. And it, it happened very quickly. And then the, and again, and we said this before the, yeah. the show started, I didn't really know anything about, I wasn't involved in the Final Fantasy VII community at all. So yeah. I hadn't really understood like the environment that it would be in or like what people would say, what, like, if this was like a welcome, uh, going to be like a welcoming community or not, not that, you know, there are some that wouldn't, but yeah. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> so I don't know how the internet is going to react to this. If anybody's going to watch it or whatever. So I just tried it and uh, it, I will say that it changed my life just from that perspective. Yeah. It's that I committed to doing something that I'd never thought I could do before. So it's more of a personal thing that even the game and now it's like what I think about most of my time and like a year later and so many things have sort it of does uh, take over, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it did. And I think it, it was just so weird to see the response from the community, which was overwhelmingly positive. That was like, I was actually stunned. Well, this is something I was talking with Mo about as well, because like you were saying, you have all those doubts when you put in these things out there and you know, in the build up to it at the very least, like I find it, it's like, is this going to be interesting? Are people going to want to listen to this, the same sort of thing? And <clears throat> when you get that positive feedback and that positive response, it validates what you've done. And this is what I was talking about with Mo. It just 100% validates it. And it is beautiful when you get that kind of positive feedback from everybody. It, it's, it's good. Yeah, I think that there's a part of my, my brain, and I don't know if... I, this happens to me every now and again where everything that I've ever like believed in seriously, like yeah. where I'm like, I, I am convinced like personally. And I feel like this radar has to sort of be like the gauge for everything that I do. It's like, I think that this will work. Like yeah. I'm, I am like 99% convinced and I have tunnel vision. And if I get that <laughs> feeling, then I, I know even if I doubt like afterwards, like I, every video before I put it on, I'm like, oh God, like what the <laughs> fuck are people going to say about this? Or yeah, shit, is, is shit. It actually <laughs> yeah. It's like, I, like I'll be like pacing around my house being, oh. like, as it's processing and shit. Uh, I, uh, I feel like that's the, the center of everything that I do though, yeah. is that feeling is like, if I'm convinced that it's going to work yeah. nine out of 10 times, it does. And it's just about listening to that and knowing that confidence. That you're not actually, yeah, exactly. The confidence of it. And I don't yeah. think I had a lot of that until the first video came out. And then I was like, okay, now I can make more of these and not feel like I don't ha like, it was just nice for a change of listening to yourself and having something pay off to a degree. And I having guess it was reinforced like that as well, because like yeah. the, the next video becomes easier. The next video becomes yeah. easier. And it is good because you kind of knock those barriers down and you kind of start realizing like, oh, I can actually do this. Oh, this works. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> I do think that it's it's a weird like sort of change in pace too, though, which is that, um, and I don't want to necessarily like, this is always weird to talk about, but like <laughs> so when we start talking about like, like I guess the sleep easy sort of brand of things, yeah, it's uh, I I see what kind of effect that video has had on like in good ways and then in bad and like how people use that in the community sometimes to reinforce like their own opinion yeah. in a way that might seem more like of like an offensive pr like approach yes. of like forcing ideas on other people, and I think with that same mentality comes the the mentality of like every video that I now make, uh, which is that it has to be worth the sort of the place that people have put up the first series of videos. The pressure well. of keeping the standards up. Right. And yeah. that's what, like, because the, the first couple of videos just came out like two weeks between each other. And like, yeah. I was just so fixated. And then as you, as my time with like YouTube and stuff like that sort of continued, they started getting paced out like way, 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 uh, like months now. So it's, it became a slower process because it was like, Okay, well now I need to have something super solid to talk about. Yeah. Otherwise, I just won't. And you've got to be uh, more meticulous about it as well and go right. through all. Yeah. I think a lot of people think that I'm just <clears throat> sitting in the back here, like, uh, like why haven't you re released something or like why isn't like when's the next video going to come out? It mainly just has to do with me not wanting to waste anybody's time. <laughs> so I, no, I get what you mean. Though. I'm doing what I'm doing. Like I'm not like a hundred percent like. 
unless I'm sold on it and I know that there's like a bot, like for instance, with the video that I'm writing now, which should be out by the end of the month and it has to, uh, because I, I'm just trying to plot everything out. Yeah. But like with this next video, um, I, I make a promise at the beginning of it to say that you will absolutely learn something vital to every single part of every game or media that we talk about that you didn't know before you started this video but like nothing that we've ever talked about before yeah and i think it's like i know that that's what people want from me is yeah. like i want to see something that i haven't seen before or people aren't talking about or yeah. like how is this explained in the right way uh to sort of reinforce the bigger picture of like what we understand of like final fantasy 7 like whether that's like remake or whatever but yeah. like in this video i was like okay that's my hook is is that i know for certain that people will have not learned x y and z before and then they'll be able to take something out of yeah, it. yeah this is like new information on like new yeah. speculation or it's, it's got to be something new and something that people won't yeah. have heard anywhere else basically. like a completely different approach and yeah. it doesn't have to be in line with anything that i've made before it just has to be something that i think is strong enough to stand on its own that you can take like if you watch one of my videos i hope that this is what happens is, is that when you go and watch like somebody else's content or you're listening or you're developing your own ideas you can sort of point to these things as truths yeah. as like directions for things to take whatever idea you're working with so it's like these are not just for me to speak like word throw up onto somebody it's like <laughs> this is also these are building blocks for you to also just use as you want for whatever ideas you have yes. for the game i think that's also one of the problems with the community in general is uh in terms of just like how these like ideas are interpreted is is that i think that there's a lot of debate over things that we already know as truths if you just look at the information correctly yes and i think there's not enough of that in in my videos to be like here's like definite lines this is not me interpreting this this is like just facts this is actually what is that what yeah. people have said yes and just instead of thinking that these things are like still up for debate it's like let's like put to rest like because we've had the game for like an, a year and a half ish <laughs> yeah. right and it's like we need to like start nailing things down for people to like take away and really like feel like they they can feel confident in like x y and z of an idea yeah they can think something every aspect of it right yes. it's like are the characters time traveling like oh like like let's like just put to bed some of that stuff yeah i think that's in the future i think that's how i'm going to try and frame a lot of my conversations it's just trying to figure that out it's tough as well because of the scope of possibilities that there are at the moment because while we know a fair bit and we know a lot, we also know absolutely nothing at the same time. Like, we know what went down in Remake, and we kind of know what Sephiroth's goal was. It was to kind of be unbound and untethered and kind of have this freedom to go and do what he wants to do now. What does he want to do? I mean, we can assume that he wants to do the same sort of things that he's previously done. But we don't know. And it, it literally, there's so many... I love, this is one of the things I love about it, because from my perspective, it is very much... I just love explore, exploring all the different possibilities. So, like, varying from the very unlikely to the likely. Do you know what I mean? And right. I, I do separate them like that. Like, I know, like, with a lot of things, it's like, yeah, this is very likely. This is almost certain to be true, but we just can't say it yet because it's not actually confirmed. Right, but, yeah. And I think that's also very important, is, yeah. is that there... I think that's... I feel like when I watch like even like some of my older videos and sometimes I go back to them just to remind myself what I, I have said yeah. <laughs> because it's been a long time or I spend times on different subjects and you kind of have to unload. You've got to refresh yourself as well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because A lot of those videos are what they are because I, I put all of my energy into subjects yeah. so that I don't have to think about them anymore. That's the other thing about the videos that I think is something that people cite videos in comments. And I'm like, I don't even really remember that because <laughs> the goal of that was just to get that out as like a word vomit and then just keep it in that box so I can yeah. start thinking about something else. So I often go back when people mention certain things about my videos just to clarify to myself what my what did i say <laughs> yeah exactly um and i get the gist of them and the structure of them and but some of the finer details it's like oh that's a 
you know, something that I, I forgot. It's a good thing stay- to do anyway, though, because sometimes you can go back to something that you've said previously and you can be viewing it through a different lens and maybe see something slightly differently. So it's, it's a useful thing to do. Yeah, I will say that uh, the the fifth video in the structure of five is yeah. something that I'm looking back to now more than usual just because that subject that is brought up in that is something that is really heavy in the video that I'm making now, um, which is about like memories and stuff like that. And yeah. I make the, the connection of Genova maybe being attached to these memories to some degree, but that obviously it was just with that one subject. And yeah. now it's the subject is expanded to like everything yeah. and how that, how memories pertain to every aspect of. I'm like, looking forward to this one as well, to be honest, because it's definitely been something that I've been thinking of quite a bit with like, not <clears throat> so much, probably more the structure of the whole reality that remake kind of takes place in to a certain degree. That's kind of been the angle that I've been coming from. And if, whether or not certain things are different because memories aren't accurate and things like that. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, I we're not, we won't go too deep into the subject, no, but no, I'm no. looking forward right. to your video. And I'm, <laughs> I'm also I'm also more open about talking about it, but I actually was watching your Lily Bunny uh, episode, and uh, that you brought up something very similar to yeah. that, um, which is, is that how much of what we're seeing is actually the way that it, is happening yeah. or is this is this being manipulated more than we are perceiving just from like the surface level of like is this a reality and i would say that i guess like as a as a jumping off point to that is is that <laughs> memories themselves seemingly and this is why i like i i really like this concept from my perspective as a storyteller because oftentimes when you think of the term time travel yeah like you think about okay here's a little line in some vague space and points in time of events and that that's what that's it there's no real time is just time and that's how it works right so as in this instance the the function of like everything in the final fantasy 7 universe from what i understand it to be is the concept of memory so these these moments in time are not just they're existing in the concept of time. It's existing in the concept of the life stream as it pertains to the memory of these events. Yes. And if you just on a surface level, looking at it, you can kind of say to yourself, well, memories in Final Fantasy VII, just the base game are really important because they are something that is very vague, very like uh, very loose, like loosely able to be changed. Yeah and sort of misrepresented yes uh specifically when it comes to our main character that's like his entire arc is like built off of the fact that he is not remembering things the way that they actually happened and also that his psyche is literally built off of like memories and consciousnesses of other people like he's not himself and that's what i like about it is is that it the concept and this is one one of my favorite things in any story is that when once you have the character's journey lined up like and in sync with what is happening with the rest of the world this is why i like the concept of star wars and the force yeah. is that all of the bigger events are then immediately tied to the the struggle of your main character and having your character's emotional journey mirror and affect the larger events in such a close sort of spiritual aspect is what I think makes a story like a 10 out of 10. Yeah, it takes it up a level. It brings everything together and makes everything kind of interact with each other. Yeah. Yeah, and I think This is one of the big reasons why I think Game of Thrones, the the books were so successful because they do that. Every character and every event has some sort of knock-on event and knock-on effect and changes the the world. Yeah. You have to convey that feeling that this is this is affecting like one person's action affects like it's a butterfly effect of exactly. others. Exactly. And I think you can do that just from a like a realistic perspective like it doesn't have to be fantasy to do that sort of like I know that yeah. Game of Thrones is is technically fan, fantasy but yeah. the idea of like somebody's small discussion with some other like king can affect literally the other continent yeah so it's like as long as the audience understands that weight to a certain degree as it relates to our characters 
I think is where it becomes a lot of the background function of this stuff when we talk about memories, I don't think is going to be 100% necessary to understanding the story to every level, but the feeling that you should be getting from it, you yeah. should be getting some sort of emotional visceral feeling from it it'll give you them additional layers as well like it it wouldn't be i mean it kind of will be core to the story but it won't be essential to understand but if you do understand it it will give you all of these additional layers of the story and the narrative and just kind of let you let you enjoy it more i think that's how i think that's one of the reasons why i agree with like the perspective of like night sky prince or a lot of people who just like the original the way the original was done and why are we changing things yeah. is because the life stream in that story is extremely important. Yeah. It's a vital piece of the puzzle there, but it's a vaguer concept yeah. in that sense that allows you to not to not put so much focus on it so you don't overthink it. And not that Magic. it's not you can't stand <laughs> yeah, not that you can't stand on it can't stand on its own two feet when you start to deconstruct it in that way. Yeah. That's also what makes it fun is is that you can kind of choose to engage with it. You can view it at whichever not. level you want and it still right. makes sense and it's still impactful. Exactly. And I think remake is definitely putting more of a focus yeah. on the two together and yeah. like one affects the other a hundred percent. Uh so I think maybe taking away that could deter some people but for me i tend to enjoy it because i feel like my way of viewing like the compilation in general at this point is is that it's a continuing conversation yes of something that started so long ago that looking at remake as something that was supposed to just exist by itself is not no possible not gonna work no and also i don't think it was going to be like that even if the compilation wasn't a thing like, I think the idea was to create a succession to the events of something that is so core to, and that's the other angle of it, right? Is, is that remake is based off of your perception of it from yeah. your standpoint. And that's the meta element as well. Yes. And that's another, <laughs> a, another whole element of it. People is love that the it, meta. <laughs> it's using your memory of it as the structure of the universe for it yeah in in my opinion is is that your memory of events is what they're using to literally construct the story of final fantasy 7 remake so it like time travel and all this other stuff however you want to put it included so i think i think once the game is done i think that will be immensely clear and i think yes. people will maybe yeah, yeah, ten years from now, we'll look back at this journey. When we're in we're in an old person's home in Scotland talking to Mo. And... <laughs> He's not that old, is he? <laughs> no, we're all gonna be that old when it. Oh when shit! Yeah, we are actually, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a thing. Oh uh, god, anyway. I'll, be, I'll be in my mid forties by then. Shit! Why have you just it's said that? Why have know. you just said that? <laughs> my girlfriend tells me sometimes I'm thinking, and she's like. When are you going to be done like talking about like Final Fantasy VII Remake? I was like, well, this game is going to be... It's going to be a while, love. It's going to be a while. <laughs> it's going to be around unless, for a long fucking time. Unless Part 2 is so catastrophically shit. But even then, I think I'd probably still go for Part 3. Even if it I was so bad, up. I'd probably still do it just because of what it is. They'll do like a Neon Genesis Evangelion yes. like, series. I've still not just, watched like, it. I have still not watched the newest one. I need to uh, watch me it. Me neither. Me oh. neither, I, but I feel like I have to be mentally prepared to do that. I kind of so. want to rewatch everything first and then watch it. And That's finding sort of the my time. Angle yeah. Too. And finding the time for that is a bit <laughs> fun. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. I do like That was literally one of the first anime shows that I ever watched. I remember like I was, I think it was about 12 or something like that. And we used to have this anime section on the sci-fi channel it was at like midnight so i'd wait till my parents went to bed sneak my tv on turn the volume down subtitles on and watch some neon genesis evangelion really there you go baby right love there love it <laughs> love yeah, it that was that gynex in general was a huge inspiration to me because it was the first studio that i um that all of their the things that they made was something that i, I just followed like i i think i've watched everything other than Panty and stockings or whatever yeah. they like did just animation for. Um, 
I've watched like all of their stuff, but they were the jumping off point from like Dragon Ball Z or like Sailor Moon, yep. or, like those sorts of like uh, entry level. That's where you start. Animes. Yeah, like I love I Dragon Ball. I, I do love Dragon yeah. Ball, but it's very much a starter. Yeah, I think people always like sort of uh, overblow it. The same same way of like uh, either television or like action movies. It's like a genre thing where people are like, well, that's sort of mindless. Like people don't. Yes. I think respect enough what it means to make something that can be enjoyed from just a simple, simple, like visceral yep. level. Not only that, that though, that. it's like the changes that they brought about, like Dragon Ball Z gets viewed as like a really simple kind of thing. But as far as anime goes, it was one of the first ones that like a lot of earlier animes, they followed the monster of the week kind of template, right. which is what X-Files did. Like you get something goes down in the episode, hero goes and deals with it. Problem solved, reset for the next episode. Whereas right. Dragon Ball came in with Vegeta and the Saiyan saga and then Freezer in the fucking Namek saga. And it was like, these guys were about for months. And you were like, yo, when are they going to get beat? What's going on? Right. It just upped the stakes. And people don't... It's the same with Seven. It was that first step into 3D gaming for Square Enix, really. And I, I just think nowadays people, if you weren't really about then, you don't appreciate the impact it had at the time yeah and it's i think as you become like and if you're like if you're into like viewing something other than just for the viewing pleasure of it i think it's way easier to start to see that when you sort of track alongside of it it's like what it took to make those connections to know that this sort of development or plot or way of organizing a story would impact somebody and yeah. how that then became the standard of what you know and then they in themselves like. they innovate as well and the next generation picks up from right, them right. and it, it, it's beautiful to watch it happen like oh god i'm so old why am i talking like this <laughs> <laughs> so old but no it, it is good to watch like i my first gaming experience was on a commodore 64 which was a cassette loading computer like it takes like 10 minutes for a game to load up you could see the tape just spinning inside the computer and that's where i started from do you know what i mean right. now look where we are now it's crazy SSDs, it's, oh, and i love it i love it in there. <laughs> yeah we're, we're getting the good shit now i know I, it makes me wish i've been born like 20 years later in, in some aspects it really does but yeah, at the same but... time i'm glad i got to see the journey if you know what i mean i think i think it's also like it all comes back too. So yeah. like a lot of like indie stuff is sort of capturing that like SNES sort of earlier day, yeah. like uh, earlier day, like look and feel that there's an appreciation for that. And the fact that like, I can even look back and just say like, it's like looking at a simpler system and working within the limitations of that yeah. and creating a story from that is also valuable. It's like yes. the way that like, uh, movies that are shot in black and white or in certain aspect ratio, it's like you can start looking at that limitation as like a way of telling a story in a different way. Yeah, because they have to and work around those limitations then, yeah. Right, and it can yield interesting results that you might not, like you might not be able to rely on dialogue, for instance. Yeah. So like you might have to resort to just text. So how do you like tell that story in an effective way? I think I always appreciate those decisions, but th- them in themselves are sort of... Uh, how would you say like innovative from the perspective of back then to now like yeah. storytelling has changed nowadays you'd be like what that. that's that's nothing new <laughs> right yeah so and that, just even like with simple like sprites like you can convey a lot so i think people that's... like the fact that that's still being pushed and i can look at that journey too i i tend to to enjoy that yeah. uh, more than anything and seeing how things are coming into their own I think that's actually we were talking about uh my hero academia before yep. i think that was one of the things that i appreciated about just watching the first season of that is is that there's a lot of careful steps taken to not overstep these yeah. certain ideas but also sort of it's not averting it it's just the best version of that it's kind of sowing the seeds in it right yes it's, it's a very meticulously yep crafted thing and knowing that it because there's like bombs that you could step on at any point in the story yeah. uh, like of making something again that's supposed to be very exciting and not have it like oh uh jumping the shark moment so yes. to speak <laughs> like you have to very like those decisions and the the craft of that is 
exceptional. So, but to know where that came from and what they're doing and to see them tap dancing over these things is yeah. exciting as a creator. So. No, no, uh, and it is definitely. I'm sure that this is going to come back to Final Fantasy VII eventually. <laughs> oh, we're literally coming back right now because oh. I was. Oh, I, I had a segue ready. I had a segue ready, and everything. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I should have trusted. I should have trusted the system. <laughs> we're two questions in. <laughs> yeah, 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 I told you. I told you this. Is uh, right. So we're going to get back to it now. We're back to the questions. Sleep Easy's back. So Mookie's gone. Yes. Mookie is gone. Mookie is gone. <laughs> For now. so we're gonna get into some opinion questions now so the first one is out of the entire compilation of final fantasy 7 who would you say is your favorite character does this include the original game oh all of it everything the whole thing okay fuck uh yeah i don't say roche either don't say roche I'm not gonna say Roche. Yeah, that's over and done with. Never again am I speaking about that character. And if you don't um, get that, you need to go and watch some SEAL Team Seven. That's right. You gotta, you gotta get on on top of the lore here. Yes, you do. Uh, yes, you do. Uh, Otherwise, it's gonna be jarring. Question. I I remember hearing this question asked to other people, and I'm like, I don't know. I have multiple, but there's I this say question that... and another question, and they're the easiest two, but they're also the hardest two as well in, at the same time. Uh, I think right. this is one of them, definitely. I do really like the character. Her, I know that this is typical, but like I think it would come down to a draw of like Cloud. Yep, Rufus is a is a really good one. No uh, one's gone with then... Rufus yet. Really, no one's that's, gone with Rufus. A couple have gone upsetting. with Cloud. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Because he is so good. It's like there's a, like a fine line, I think, that re, that just in general Final Fantasy VII yeah. makes with these really interesting dynamics for yes. characters because you kind of expect Rufus to show up and just be a fuck, right? Like yeah. just like his dad, like a complete shit. Yeah, there's much more to him though. But much he's more. So much more of an interesting. It's like you didn't realize that you're trading in present shinra with a present shinra like 3.0 yeah. right like this guy is like insanely intelligent knows what's happening at every given time and is constantly plotting how he gets to be on top of he's this he's definitely got the capacity to be just as brutal as president shinra as well i think he's just a bit more measured with it yeah he just yeah. knows his mind is like so much more as you said like measured to yeah not attacking it from like such a surface level or basic it's not like president chin was like okay well i'm like, just gonna X, drop y, a fucking plate on people, people. Right. <laughs> people are stupid and i'll just be able to get away with this and i can kind of just rely on like the aspects of these sheep but like uh to rufus there's such a calculated measure yes. of like how do i seep into not only like the minds of the people who are following me, but the people that are my enemies. Yes. Like, how do I control everything? And how, like, what does it take for me to get to my eventual goal, which is not just to control, like, you know, the power supply of Mako. It's yeah, like, he wants more than that. I want more. control of yeah. everything in a way that people don't even have to know. It's unquestioned. Yeah, yeah. But, it's just, it's just, it is. I am just it's in just control. Controlling the narrative, I think, is what it is. That's what I was, the word I was looking for. He wants to control the narrative. He doesn't need to be yeah. like the face of Avalanche. He doesn't need to be the face of like Wu Tai or anything. He just wants to control their narrative so that it fits in line, so he can just craft it whichever way yeah, he wants. The flow it. of information needs to be what he right. deems it to be. Basically, and people wonder why he can't. He he's like able to see the whispers. It's because this guy is like, li- he's the reason why the game ends up being the way it is in OG. Like, how do the, how do you think the party gets into the into the fucking uh, northern? Crater? See, this is the thing though. In in the OG, they don't make that. They don't make yeah. It's it's he's a, not I as well say, shown off in the OG. Like you I need, know people. It's when you see like Advent Children and Before Crisis and things like that. Right. That's when he really gets fleshed out. Yeah, people people have uh, that are way more knowledgeable about the character than I am. Shout outs to Auto Ignition. Uh, yeah, that know that character way more than I do, and would argue that that character is present in the OG. It's just not as blatant. Yeah. I never saw him like that because yeah. he was never in the forefront of my mind. Of you the have story. to look for it. 
Yeah, you would have yeah. to like, and I, I haven't even played through the game as as recently to be able to like really like nail down like if that is true to me or not. Yeah. But I will say, like you already mentioned, is is that it's so much more prevalent in the um in the compilation, yeah. like that sort of mentality and how they took that character, and uh, it's a very apparent that they're working that same thing in to remake. Yeah. Uh, I would I would say he, I'm very excited for him. I really like that character. If I'm guilty pleasuring it, I will say that Elf is probably one of those characters Ooh. that I, I really like. That's another outside personally. of the box one. I love it. I just think that there's like, and that and this is why Before Crisis is so interesting to me. Be, yeah. And I think this is why I also chose Rufus is because it's about the dynamic of where people want just one thing to go. Like there are like three different aspects of how people see Avalanche going yeah, and they're all working together. And then as we know from like remake and sort of softly confirmed or not softly, like just confirmed, confirmed well, and remake to sort of be happening is like you have Elf and like Fajito and then I guess Rufus. We don't know if they're involved yet, but yeah, like yeah. we know that Elf exists in remake to some extent. Um, I, I mean, through the Tales, the Tales book. I think Fort the, Condor is going to be a pretty telling location when we get into it in remake part two like i think that could easily end up being like a base of operations against the shimra like it is in the original game if that's the case we could see some of these characters there i feel like they're i think they're inevitable and yeah. i think i think intergrade was sort of that soft ball hard ball to some people yeah. but for us who were kind of seeing some of this coming like a softball of like, okay, this this compilation stuff is, is gonna not work? just going to come down to like, <laughs> like uh, it's not going to just come down to an Advent Children or a Crisis yeah. Core reference. Like we're pulling out all the stops. Yeah. And I think they just went to the farthest degree of silliness and made it work, which is Vice and Nero and Deep yeah. Ground. Yeah, because those representations we're... of those characters compared to Dirge of Cerberus, it's so much yeah, better. It's... Night, it's and night and day, day because yeah. of the awareness, I think. And yeah. I think that was all they needed to sort of accomplish with de demonstrating to people. Yeah. It's like we're aware that these characters are completely outside of the box, very strange, but we're going to kind of work to that advantage almost a little bit. And also just dial into what makes these characters interesting. Yeah. And like with Nero, he didn't come off as particularly strange anymore and weird. He came off as just like really creepy and dark, and it, it was kind of like an evolution of what they were previously. It's like a big fan. It's as good as that character is ever going to get. Probably, <laughs> yeah, probably. In, in my in my opinion, like especially because I'm not a huge fan of Nero in um in, in uh, Dirge of Cerberus as yeah. far as like the way that he he demonstrates himself. But in the concept of him, I, I don't mind. I don't mind the concept. And that's a lot of how I This is a lot of the compilation in general for me. Like, concept-wise, right. yeah. It works. Execution-wise, what did you do? Yeah, what happened? <laughs> what, how did this get grimlit? Like, me and Mo uh, were talking about it. The, cri the reels in Crisis Core. That's the biggest indicator of it for me. Because in that final battle, that reel system works perfectly as a narrative tool. I, it is I so good. I 100% agree. 100% agree. It's like they've reverse engineered it through the rest of the game then. They've decided they want the end to be agree. like that and then just gone, fuck it, we'll do that. I actually think that that might have been the way that they did it just because um, that scene in particular is the, the scene that I think it was Katase, I think, who said this, where he was like, I was never really like sold on the system until the scene that you just mentioned. It, it, is, is, it works as well. It it's so, so well. good. Yeah. I agreed. I was like, that's exactly where that narrative and gameplay storytelling sort of lines up perfectly yeah. to make this work. But it doesn't work for me in any other instance yeah. other than as an example of something that could be good, but it doesn't really work out for me. Even if you just cut it 80% of the time, just drop it out of the game 80% of the time and have it pop up in boss battles maybe. As like right, a little exactly. shonen power boost moment, and then or it's like an you get on the side or something. Yeah, like... and then when you get to the end, you get the serious spin on it. I think that would have been a lot more impactful, but hindsight. <laughs> yeah, it's super weird, and I think that it it was fun to see it, and I think look at it again as a concept, as you sort of said. Yeah, it, it doesn't necessarily hold up in terms yeah. of like I can see this on paper working. <laughs> 
And I think that's where they started. It's like, okay, I see this working. So like, let's just try our best to get it to work. And I think that they spent more time like editing that system than anything else. Yeah. From what I just see in the interviews, it's like we worked on that like throughout development. And it's like, if yeah, you're, well. <laughs> if you're fighting games or you're, you're fighting your, your, uh, your battle system for yeah. a game is barely functioning to you in terms of how it works Ain't for work. so long. Maybe it, it like you're forcing it. And I think that's what it feels like. It feels like that, as you said, back uh, reverse engineering it. Well, I mean, like it could be. The the... You've got to think as well, though, Square, they've always kind of been that company that innovates and tries new things. And I suppose there is a lot of, like we were talking about earlier with, like when you put a big video out and it does well, there's then that pressure to maintain that standard. In the same way, it's going to be a hundred times worse for these game developers. Like, you've got to live up to the standard of Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, and that's. <laughs> I think that was the. I think that's. I think that's one of the reasons why I give like the compilation a little bit more of a pass. Yeah. I can see how this ruins the experience for people who started with Seven and adored it and then went on. But like to see, and obviously there's a money making angle to like. Yeah producing final fantasy 7 we all know games. how the like, world works <laughs> yeah. uh, but the idea that these games all tried to do something semi-unique yeah is is admirable but i also will go back and say that from a storytelling perspective i think that they do a really good job of building a, a future narrative i think yeah. collectively i think i say this on it's my a good foundation on, to build on yeah, 100%. Yeah. I think Final Fantasy VII just started out that way. But I think, like, if you – and we were talking about this. If you just start at the beginning, yeah. right, and just see how a, the narrative storytelling grows over time, yeah. it feels like they're trying to get somewhere in the compilation to really say something important about – just Final Fan what Final Fantasy VII represents overall. Well, I'm pretty like sure that. I've seen them say before that they always intended there to be a fifth part of the compilation. I, I am yeah. sure that I've seen this somewhere. I, 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 off the top of my head, I can't remember who said it. Um, they, they, I think by the fact, by the time uh, Crisis Core was a thing, they yeah. had already planned on making d this fifth. game. Yeah. Yes. And then they just uh, had to take 10 years off from it, basically. Yeah, the... From what I understand, what Nomura said, he was the only guy really attached to the project. Yeah. And he tried to get it off the ground and couldn't just because there was like no manpower to help him do do that. So I think that's another misconce misconception. Well, suppose and there was all of the, you had a lot of 13 stuff going on around that time. You had the development yeah. hell that was 13. So I also think that the, it, the idea that everybody had from what I've seen in like interviews, I've been reading like a lot of like magazine interviews, shout out to, to Gene uh, for providing like so much of these, these interviews. Is that in the Discord? From, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So one of the things that uh, he, he was bringing to our attention is, is just like all of the times where uh, they talked about remake before remake was ever a thing and like how it's never going to happen. But one of the things that Nomura said at some point was he's like, until everybody's schedule is open, like everybody yeah. who can be a part of it. And I think that's what ultimately he came to. But it it is wanting to have everybody on board, but the inception of the idea is 100% Nomura's because he yeah. literally tried to make the game already by himself. And he went to Katase eventually with the idea of like, if we're going to remake the game, we're going to do it the way that we were going to do it back then is yes. sort of how I see that conversation going down. And especially with all these nods to like, uh, the way that Nojima no is sort of writing all of this stuff, yeah. like with Elf and all of these other things that are happening, like they're, they are very conscious of everything that came before it. I think oh, that's yeah. at this point completely inarguable. I think they're quite conscious of some of the criticisms as well. Like they will be conscious of like the reception that these games got and the fact that people were... I mean, some people hated them, but I mean, even at the very least, you would I don't think anyone could argue that the ex execution was off slightly. So they'll know this and they'll be thinking, right, this is our opportunity to put this yeah. right. They're definitely aware of it because there are even interviews of yeah. like people talking about like Dirge of Cerberus to Crisis Core, like that Dirge of Cerberus was like a dumpster fire and like, <laughs> what are you going to do to like re Aww. rectify this in, in Crisis Core? And then just obviously like a very political response of like, you know, not saying, oh, yeah, Dirge was shit. Like, they're like, okay, well, we were just trying something new. Maybe it didn't work out as well as 
we might have thought it yeah. was, but like we we're learning as we're going along in in the future when we do another shooter, we'll oh, know God, what no. to do next time. So, like, <laughs> right, and I don't think anybody wants that. No, no, there's no, a, no. <laughs> there's a thing that uh, I think Shade MP, who's uh, who's a speedrunner slash just data miner of like Dirge of Cerberus and one of the most knowledgeable knowledgeable people on that game, yeah. just recently found that. Uh, there's a, a certain game mechanic that he didn't know about since he, like, in, like, the 10 years that he's been playing the game or however long he has been. And he was like, there's, like, how could I not have known this? And then in the back of my mind reading that, I'm like, if there's a mechanic in your game that would have made this easier, which it does, it's like a galleon beast ability um, where it's like a homing a homing ball uh, rather than, <laughs> a, than just a straightforward fireball. Yeah, yeah. It's like, would have made things infinitely easier and the oh. fact that it's only being discovered right now is sort of awful <laughs> it's sort of the worst thing that i could hear news wise that is so. depressing that is quite depressing because who do you blame them do you blame squeenix for not explaining it properly or i was thinking not reading? Like, wouldn't you have that in a manual or something like somewhere like yeah, there must the be a description somewhere? yeah yeah there's got right. to be a description in the game or something so, uh, like that i've not played it for a very long time, so I, I've repressed all those memories. I'll be replaying it at some point, and I know for sure that I will need. Well, now to you know. know. What that ability is. Yeah, now exactly. You know. <laughs> Just to see how easy it makes the game, and it's like, oh, this isn't that bad. Like maybe it's, <laughs> maybe it actually makes it okay. Um, so yeah, we've got Cloud, so. we've got Rufus, we've got Elfe. Any more? Any more. I like Barrett a lot. I think I just enjoy, I, I hate to say it, but I'm just such a big fan of, I like Vincent a lot too. But Everyone I think, loves Vincent. <laughs> I think it's more of the, I, I want to maybe say that I, I think I like Rufus and Cloud just more because it's not, that's not potential, right? In those characters, those characters have already reached that level of potential yes. for me like realization. Whereas like the concept of Elf in the, in the scope of the world yeah, I think is a really interesting character, and, and has a lot of potential. Done about that. Yeah, right. Same with Vincent. I think oh. that Vincent is a character that can fall off, like into just being like, uh, like eye candy and like sort of this sort of like. And I like again, I like all of the aspects of his character. I want that pushed. Yeah, like way, way more. Oh, and we I need we need everything that went down back in the day between him and Lucrezia and Hojo. We need that. Right, like, that would be great. Because in the original game, it was definitely like a side character. You know, it was an extra character that you could acquire. You didn't. You could complete the game without ever speaking to Vincent. Right. But that's definitely not going to be the case. That's now. not going to be the case. No, There's no, no way. No, no, no. You don't <laughs> stick you as a side character and then just think that she's not going to be a main playable character later. And this is what makes me hopeful because we got a Yuffie DLC, the other additional character that you didn't have to acquire as you play through the game. So, you know... I'm you just have, looking for anything to grab onto. <laughs> Honestly, you would have the most stuff to go into. Yeah. And I think that it's it would be a no-brainer to pick him if there ever was any talk about like a DLC for another character. Well, if I remember we'll right, even... he's connected to every single part of the compilation in some yeah, way, so shape, or form. Crisis. Yeah. Uh, he's in, yeah, he's in, I think, everything yeah. so far. So Because he's so fucking old. Well, this is he's it. Also yeah, he was also involved with like the story prior to everything. Yeah, so yeah. like he's involved in every step of the way of like major, major elements of the story. He's... The only thing he's not fucking involved in is like Genova. Genova. Showing up on Imagine, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Genova crash like, lands and Vincent's just sat there on a cliff, like, yeah. bitch. <laughs> uh, what do I have to do now? <laughs> Gonna go rude. Um, yeah. <laughs> Kratzy is not around at this point. Uh, yeah. I can wait. That's that's the, the insane theory. Is Genova is Lucrezia, and <gasps> Vincent is the the old lover of. <laughs> yeah, this is a fan fiction, all right. That yeah, was right. Let's go. <laughs> we'll talk to him after the stream. We'll get him to He's write it. Yeah, yeah. We'll. Maybe. You can do the word stuff. Yeah, exactly. Fine. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, even, I know that you mentioned this too, is that, uh, Lucre uh, not Lucrezia, but even Kate Sith, I am excited for yep. specifically because of this connection with like Reeve. Yeah. Uh, because I think, and I mentioned this on the stream, it would be really cool to just see what's happening in Midgar. Um, 
with That's... like through Reeves' eyes as the story is going on. Like, okay, like we know that Kate Sith eavesdrops to yep. get information. It would be cool to like play as Reeve as the like side. Yeah. listening to like and then coming into a meeting with like Rufus or Heidegger or even like Scarlet and then like them like you know Scarlet trying to find out like <laughs> because we know that Scarlet knows uh more than any other character yeah. that Rufus that there's somebody in the chain of command that is working against them. Yeah. And so we know that what we're gonna need is her sort of snooping around and sort of probing. And like, uh, oh, it's gonna be. This is why I love this this thing that remake has done is is that they've just perfectly set up the inclusion of just so many more interesting yeah. like levels of like arcs or just like yeah. intense moments or like you can see the groundwork. Yeah, yeah, it's like jumping around like in Star Wars to so like each character and just being like, oh my god, and we're gonna leave this off on a cliffhanger, <laughs> and then we're going back to the party, and like, I want that throughout the entire experience. And I think everybody has a part to play in that. And Reeve, Reeve could be a really in, yeah. interesting into that. I'm looking forward to a slightly more, a, a slightly more serious portrayal of Kate Sith, to be honest, because in the OG, Kate Sith definitely comes off as just a very like, uh, character to me, you know, like, useful in some parts, semi-important, but I don't really care. Whereas mm -hmm. I feel like with you saying there, if we get more of a connection to Reeve, that's yes. going to make us care more about the character, I think. I also think that it's going to be really important, as you're sort of pointing out, is the, the portrayal of Kate Sith as the character, as that particular role, yeah. and then how that's reflected on the Reeve. Yeah. I think the way that you handle Kate Sith needs to be... I think the problem with Kate Sith, and it's probably going to be the same thing, and I, I'm, I'm sort of bracing myself for that, um, is but, like the silly token like yep. like fortune telling cat robot thing just a gold saucer uh, music playing in the background constantly that's exactly. all i can think of <laughs> yeah you put a coin in the slot machine and the song just starts playing but uh i think if you make that character interest interesting and in, like even like the way that they move the way that yeah. they talk just building more of an interesting level of um uh, of mystery and then again that through line being that this is actually just a puppet through yeah. which re speaks to the party and tying those two things closer together i think will make that character more interesting that's yeah. what the the goal of remake by default is just make everybody's role in this story matter yes. more than it ever did and well we will come back to that one later on <laughs> shell that one we will definitely come back to that one later on because i don't i don't, I don't want you to go saying it all and then have to think of something no, 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 later right <laughs> but the next one is and i'm pretty sure i know the answer to this one where are you at with remake at the minute like how positive are you how happy are you with it do you have any causes for concern or are you just 100 percent like let's fucking go i think that it's it, when we were talking about this before with like other narratives, I think what remake I do, I do respond positive, positively yeah. with all of it. And I think that it's a really interesting game to think about. And I really am enjoying the setup that they've created. And I think it's a really solid foundation to build like a very, very good future for remake. Yeah. Um, as far as like trepidations, I think uh, they've set, off on this journey where they're just walking such a fine line that they're, the amount of awareness that it will take to not ruin the story yep. is so thin of a line to cross that it's it's difficult to see how they're going to accomplish this 100 percent uh without any flaws yeah going into it and i want to believe that they're doing this right uh right now but i i myself also am waiting to see like how, how it goes does. yeah like how they handle it because i think it's as much as i believe in like all of the ideas that are going into the game i think it all comes down to the way that it's presented yeah, and it's that future. was some of my issues with like intermission uh in some of the aspects of storytelling where i think certain things were overplayed yes. and overdone and not necessary and i think it's weird because and i think this is sort of when uh you sort of look at just the ending of like remake itself where people were just tossing ideas in yeah and you could feel those differences like there's creative 
changes that are happening where there's like this level of awareness where it feels like they know exactly what they need to be doing. Like with characters <laughs> like Nero and yeah. Vice being presented in a way that's actually acceptable to most audiences is incredible. But then on the other hand, there are like these really overplayed moments where it's like, th why are some of these moments so aware and some of them not? Yeah. It is and a bit of like a disconnect. You, have to, you yeah. have to pick one because it's not like you can do new things, but it's, it's about the approach of how they, you, your awareness of how they'll be received. Yeah. It doesn't feel like somebody's in control of every aspect. So just by default, I think that sort of worries me. Yeah. That yeah. something's going to slip in somewhere and then they're going to have to commit to something that they didn't choose. Or maybe do damage control or something like that. Yeah. 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 Right. Write so, themselves into a corner. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of work that they need to do. Uh, to to make all of this tie up neatly, and I'm very very interested to see how they do that. That's one of the biggest uh, things for me because some of the concepts and some of the the storytelling mechanisms that they're using going into it, like they are very very. You can get this right, or you can ruin this entire story potentially if you, like you say, don't tread that fine line. So it's it, yeah, I think that's one of the more compelling things about it, to be honest with you, because it's. It's kind of like there's an additional layer of danger on top of it as well. Yeah, no, and I think this is, that was sort of the intention, yeah. too, that they don't want anybody to feel easy about this. Yes. They don't want people to feel comfortable in it. I know what's which coming, is yeah. A, is a risk, is like, when you, like, whether that's a meta decision or not, like, you have put your audience on edge in a way that makes or breaks the rest of the game. And it's like... If that's the decision making, it's like you better be fucking sure as shit that this is going to work. <laughs> yeah, you better be uh, confident in this. <laughs> yeah, but then if you think about it from the other way, where it's like if you think about that reckless abandon, it's like are you just setting yourself up to see if you can match the occasion, and you don't know whether or not this is going to work out or not? Like, are you putting yourself in that position as well? I don't. I would like to think not. Well, I mean, I remember but, there was an interview. Oh, oh. Again, I can't remember who the interview exactly was with, but I'm sure there was an interview where they said, like, oh, we're not sure exactly where it's going to go yet. And it's like, no, don't talk shit. You know exactly where this is going. And if you don't, I'm very concerned. Yeah, <laughs> I would I would be concerned. Yeah, the, 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 I, like, I, like we said earlier, I don't believe anything that these people say in interviews. I have no faith. There's a part of me that has sort of adapted <laughs> to, like, looking at some of this stuff that comes through the grapevine but I, 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 there's like a very fine line that they create for themselves. Some of the stuff that they, if you just look at like older interviews with like Nomura and like Katase and like Nojima, like the, the, it's like looking at the present day discussion of remake in the past and yeah. sort of seeing the way things are worded and the way that they dance across things that we now know are like truths and stuff like that. I don't think that it is as vague as, it's just about understanding what they're trying to hide and yeah. where, right? So I do believe them. I just Ish. don't. <laughs> Ish. Ish. When it comes to changes in the story, I think maybe that's where I think people get hung up because it's like, okay, well, oh, I things think, are changing. I, I think they're lying 100% about that. Like the way they've said, like, oh, it's going to be the same. No, it's not. It can't be now. At this stage, it, it, if it is the same story, what was the point? I do think that there's enough information present to say that there's definitely going to be some changes. Yeah, but we'll I probably definitely... visit the same locations, probably yeah. in the same order. Or... You're still in the same world. I think yeah. the way that I look at it, like just from a story perspective, is, is that the flow of time. Yeah. From this, this is the thing that I tell myself at night so that I don't like wake out. <laughs> About Wake up in a panic for her. Right. Oh god, the game's gonna change. Uh, like completely, is that uh, the flow of time still moves towards what it's supposed to? Yeah. Right. The only thing that we did is we just took the the like uh, the training wheels off. So the the story can now drift the away from that yeah. narrative. But the the overall goal, we just remove them. So the yeah. wheels are off, but we're still heading in the same direction. So until something in the narrative seriously changes like a massive change and we all know what that change is probably gonna be <laughs> i don't think i think it'll still happen just later i don't know i think I, that's I, gonna I, be the change I, though 
just uncertain about it just because of just the way that I'm uh, it's it's difficult it's and tough. I don't it like is. the question because it is <laughs> obviously I think this has been talked about from every angle possible yeah but I think we all understand the importance of her her narrative yes and we want this to happen we want that to happen and there's just for me I never like I'll like on any given day I'll say something different or not <laughs> yeah. I think it's important narratively that things go the way that they go in yes. that instance. See, one thing uh, for me is, uh, like, like I say, I think it will happen, but differently. And in the original game, there's cut content, there's dialogue that she has in, like, the, um, I forgot again, what's the place called that you snowboard into? Great Glacier. There we go. So you're in the Great Glacier after the snowboarding, and if she's in your party at that point, Aerith, has dialogue programmed into the game specific yeah. non-generic dialogue and i kind of feel like she's going to survive a bit longer that, that's kind of where i'm at make it, make it out of that situation to the crater i think she'll get to the north crater and then she'll she'll meet a similar fate to cloud ending up in the live stream but she won't come back that's where yeah. i'm at i think that the stakes of of this do come back i i think that this is how i i've always well now that i the way that i look at the game now yeah. is is that the death of Aerith is important to cloud's narrative more than it is anything else and i yeah. think one of the things that remake has obviously done is it's really put uh a lot and when we were talking about world affecting character and vice versa yeah. and like those things being very similar i think what remake has done finally in terms of like how this has sort of been started a narrative that started in the compilation but remake is sort of putting into like a de definitive way yeah is that Aerith and Sephiroth and the live stream itself all sort of are being played through one character which is Cloud in terms of like his actions the importance of his actions yeah. to them personally as well as the bigger picture of the story all being done through just this one character so when you make those characters important to him and on such a vital level uh and just even like who he is as a person like yeah. both physically and also emotionally which i can talk about maybe a little bit more in depthly if we need to um if you make such a drastic change you are changing fundamental aspects of who cloud is yeah and not in just like a oh like i haven't it's not a superficial that. thing yeah We're yeah talking about like the dna of a character's like conscious like person and changing his consciousness to a degree yeah. that is very different it's a very different character when you take i think that's also and i i'm sure that people think about this more than i do but like even zach surviving it has yep. major implications to like how cloud is as a person in that particular moment because of just the effect that yeah. zach's death has on cloud as a person but another so, thing as well with like the everything it's such a pivotal event in, in cloud's life like there's two of them that happen in the game like the loss of Aerith and the live stream scene with Sipa. you take either of those scenes out you lose who cloud is to a certain degree yeah, and I think that there's, I think those are those are major yeah. key moments, especially in the original game. Yeah, like more so than anything else. Like just speaking specifically from like a remake standpoint, like those are moments that people are were waiting for. Like yeah. when a remake was coming out, I wanted to. I was like in my head picturing like the Northern Crater, Aerith's death, how that whole end game goes down, and the visual of that and the spectacle of those moments. I think. You're just cheating yourself out of money if you don't <laughs> do that. Give me the so, thing that I want right. to see, and I will pay right. for it. <laughs> exactly. Um, but, yeah, I think it would be a shame to, to lose those moments. Yeah. No, I Even agree. for me, as somebody who, who genuinely, I'm open to seeing new stuff. Changes, yeah. But I, I have this thing. I just want to see it. I just want to see, see this it. See, this is kind of why I feel like they're going to move it. Like, I think it will still happen, but I think they'll move it. And mm. I, because I can't imagine the game without it happening. Like, literally, I, 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 I can't. <laughs> right, exactly. So I, I think the other thing, too, is the way that memories sort of play into the same concept yeah. of where a lot of people use the, the um, 
the narrative thing of like we are sort of it need we're, we're needing to experience loss yeah right the suddenness of loss no one can expect sudden loss from a game where everybody knows that that's going to happen there's no sudden loss to Aerith that's going to happen yeah because it is literally the most spoiled thing in gaming it is ever the Darth Vader <laughs> moment of, yeah of Final Fantasy yeah like you can't not know about that and so, on some level, even if you just know, like, oh, doesn't that girl in the pink dress get the stabby yeah, stab? Get the, <laughs> that story goes there, right? And that's what happens. And then his gloves you know, come on and off, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the, the point of that, I hope, on a quick side note, I hope that they do that in the cutscene. If it does happen and he is dropping from the ceiling as usual, I want to see them gloves disappearing and reappearing like yeah, doing that. Would original. be great. Yeah. Is that there's some sort of like narrative, narrative <laughs> element to like this happening? I'm down. Consistency. Yeah, that's right. Consistency <laughs> with the original. Um, the what was it? The um, the idea that I think remake is taking to that same degree is that w- rather than dealing with like a sudden loss, I yeah. think the approach from a remake's perspective, and especially dealing with like memories and all this other stuff, including Advent Children. Uh, is the idea of like dealing with it. Yeah. Like you're you're sort of revisiting because a lot of times like and if anybody's experienced anything like this, like sudden loss is sudden loss and there's not you can't process everything yeah. in that moment and a lot of that stuff if you've experienced something like that comes back to you later. Uh, it's one of the things that I sort of forgive advent children for is like here's two year two years later cloud all of a sudden dealing with like Post the, the FF7 trauma, music. yeah, yeah, and it's like that makes sense if you've, re- if you really yeah. sit down and start thinking about things that have impacted you in that way without having worked through them. That well, is you, what happens. Your brain protects itself naturally. Yeah, like, exactly. that's literally what your brain will do. Your brain will be like, right, no, we can't do this right now. We'll just, yeah, we'll revisit this at another time. <laughs> we'll, yep. we'll get everybody back together at a future date. Look at the dancing um, monkey. Look at the dancing monkey. Yeah, exactly. Here are the keys. <laughs> like, it's uh it's definitely a lot of that. And I think yeah. <clears throat> in remake it feels like that's the narrative approach to what we're going through. And I think that's it's like working through not just like the Nibelheim incident of like coming through like and putting the pieces back together. A part of this is sort of like this weird therapeutic like moment of cloud coming into this moment in, yeah. of ac way earlier where it's like not only that just that either knows. but you've just kind of triggered something with me what if the whole zack side thread feeds into that same I think that's exactly what yeah it's like, yeah it's all this this way of working out and i think this is when you come down to it and the way that ac sort of talks about zack and Aerith's effect on the psyche of cloud and what he's dealing with in yeah. that story it comes down to the idea that he isn't even now, even as cloud exists in advent children, these people are still a part of him. Yeah. And I think, and he's still feeling that impact. Right. And I think a part of it and even Nojima, which I think was like one of the most insightful things that I read or listened to interview wise of advent children, even Nojima doesn't see cloud's journey being over after Sephiroth is defeated. He says that, even though he stood up to fight against Sephiroth, which is sort of that symbolism of him like coming into his own yeah. uh, again, is that he's like, this is just the start. Yeah, and that's him kind of reclaiming idea. himself pretty much. Right. Yeah. This is just the start of the healing process yeah. of him like accepting all of this stuff. Yeah, he's banished those what, demons. Right. I yeah. think what Remake is, is that the rest of that journey where it's like, okay, now Cloud is aware that he needs to work through these things in a more thorough way. And I'm strictly speaking from a narrative perspective. I'm not speaking through necessarily exactly ABC of like, this is why we're back in remake is because cloud is going back through past. No, but it's going to be one of the threads that we see kind of explored as we go through the game. Definitely. It's picking up where it left cloud off in the perspective of the OG remake cloud. I think in the same way that it's picked up with Vice and Nero and things like that. Right. And the same way that also Sephiroth and Aerith are also an extension of yeah. their future selves to a degree, I think. is Yeah, especially think, Sephiroth. Especially Sephiroth. I think 
that's one of the things that I can't figure out exactly how their narrative is going to complete themselves because I can see where Cloud is ending up. I, in in a way that is like an expansion on his character past Advent Children, where yes. it's like, okay, this is the journey that he's taking. And then I can see Sephiroth also coming into another form of himself as well, just based off of the fact of Edge of Creation, Ode Sephiroth's yes. sort of way of exclaiming that he himself has gained something that he hasn't he's had. He's always had the, yeah, yeah. So these all of the characters are evolving, even the villains of yes. the story. I genuinely don't know where Aerith fits into that necessarily yet because I do think that she is going to have to come into some new form of herself that fits the narrative of this. Yeah. I don't think that Aerith is going to... Aerith needs to go through something new. The one thing that I'm, I thought was really strange was the... I think it was in the recent Ultimania Plus. I think there was an interview in it. Um, I want to say Katarze again, my memory is shit, but I'm pretty sure someone said that it was a future Aerith that appears to Cloud during yes. the resolution scene. Now, could yeah. that tie into this this I kind 100%. of evolved form of Aerith, so to speak? Could that be that form? And we just haven't met her yet, except for in that scene, of course. Right, and I think that particular side of things, I think this is what, what bugs me about Aerith's character in general, in terms of like the way people see her, and I know that there's a lot of. I'm a Clareth. Let's just come out and say it. I'm just kidding. Um, oh, I thought you were with me then, bastard. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, am, I, I like I like Aerith Aerith's relationship a lot in the story, yeah, yeah. the way that she's represented 100. percent um, The uh, there's an aspect of the original game, uh, especially with like, uh, with how I see Aerith. In, in that moment in Cosmo Canyon when uh, she's explaining to Cloud that she is yeah. she, what she's learned from like the other like elders of like or the other scholars of Cosmo Canyon that she genuinely is the last Cetra and yeah. what that job sort of pertains to in terms of like what she has to ultimately accomplish yeah. or what she feels is getting the feeling that she has to accomplish. And just that loneliness of the character at that moment really is something that I feel gets lost after that moment. Like right. she, she doesn't have a lot of these moments where she just drops guard and like, isn't so composed. I think ultimately what I want to see with her character is her to that, to crumble a little bit. And I think yeah. the thing that would really scare the shit out of me, if like I was playing through remake is to see Aerith start to like falter a little yeah. bit. Because she is like the nail in the in the pin of the party for a bit to like be like we're drive like we're driving forward. I'm gonna protect the planet. You're coming with me. You're gonna be helping me. The stabbing obviously. Cuts Pause into one second that. because my girlfriend just interrupted us. <laughs> Subscribe to Sector Six's YouTube channel. Hit all of the likes and sub buttons and the bell. He's not here for this, but we can. He can use this. I love you, and I miss you. Ah, oh, sat on my headphones. Problems. <laughs> there we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I guess just really quickly picking up where we left off, the concept of Aerith being the, the sort of pin in the story. Yeah. And then her faltering in remake would be a really interesting thing to see because I think that fear of what can happen and like her not having control, if this really is like the finale of the game, like nothing else to be done, nothing yeah. else to be like, like if this is all chips down on the table sort of event, if she fucks up, that's it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like the weight of her actions in OG are sort of, buffered by the planet is leading me to do x y and z yeah it's Whereas, not it's not an entirely dire situation she's not on her own she's right. got that guidance to a certain degree whereas right now they've pretty much kind of to the planet so i wonder if it's going to be this aspect because we know that like Aerith sort of carries on i wonder if because of the actions of remake that these characters no longer have that level of connection to each other 
and having that like feeling at some point yeah. in, in remake specifically where it's like i think we're all kind of alone in this right now and the power for this has been my stance from the beginning is this power of friendship discussion and remake is a bunch of horseshit yeah and i think the story is sort of setting that up very carefully is that the power of unity is not going to carry us through the entire yeah. narrative and i think that's the key to understanding everything of the story is like this is about cloud becoming himself yeah. not an amalgamation of like a legacy or what Aerith is to him or how Sephiroth has a say in this. I think the good and the evil having a say over cloud is not the overall message yeah. that they want to bring into it, but rather this character becoming himself completely and owning himself completely is going to be the narrative structure. But I can see how maybe a stab at like Aerith getting stabbed and realizing that like, there's nothing else like after this yeah. for her to do would scare the shit out of me. Like seeing a character that like knew all the answers had everything together and the planet had a plan for her. And it still now went we wrong have a plan for her yeah. and she dies. And now there's no backup plan. Yeah. I think I would, I would be like, well, like my hands are shaking. Oops. My eyes are burning. <laughs> like, yeah. shit, would go, shit would go wrong for me really quickly as far as like- Gamora just stood crazy. behind you like this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I'll have a fucking, I'll, I'll put him in the background. I'm photoshopping uh, that and putting it in the yeah. video. That'll be on Perfect. screen right now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, oh, point, love it. The point is that- yeah, it's. I think you have to. I think the if you can settle into the fact that destiny no longer is leading them to anything, yeah. and that their actions, if they fail, ultimately mean nothing. Yeah, that's a lot of stakes to put into the game of what of like Final Fantasy VII because even Aerith in the original yeah. one comes back and saves shit. Like yeah. she's the one that ultimately saves the planet well, this is kind of why i think she might last a little bit longer because i think it'd be really interesting because she knows what's in store for her if she survives past that moment she knows nothing and that yeah, would be a very interesting i think she's got an inkling i don't know i don't know it's tough because like one of my big theories on it is is she getting this information from well not a theory it's a question but one of my big questions is is Aerith getting the information passively via the live stream or is someone feeding her this information? And then it becomes a question of who's feeding her this information. Could it be the planet or could it be Seth? Because imagine mm -hmm. if Sephiroth's just been drip feeding her as much as she needs to know so that he gets his way. I, I think that's where a lot of the confusion for me comes in now because yeah. as like, for me, as I start like trying to solidify answers to questions, a lot of like new questions come up and the oh, vagaries all the time <laughs> yeah 100 percent. it just expands yeah exactly it just gets larger and larger yeah. and it's one of the things that i try to keep in mind like is i'm not 100 percent sure of anything yeah i always try and leave things as open-ended as possible but there are certain things that seem solid enough like memories of the future yeah era can very easily access the live stream. It's like just what a Cetra does. Yeah. So I, it feels like if there were poten potentially a consciousness that existed in the live stream could very easily give anybody any information at any time if they really want. Well, this is another that. thing that the recent, like the light novel, the uh, Traces of the Two Past the Air, I think it kind of, it, it gives you more context on how that projection like that's what i've been calling it at least yes. like cetera projection it gives you sure. more of an insight on how that works and kind of what's possible throughout it and we see it in remake like when she touches marlene and when she touches red 13 and things like that and she's able to transfer that information like, i kind right. of feel that a pure-blooded cetera you know like if i'll know they can do it without touch pretty much and it'd be interesting to see if air its abilities develop in any way because if she has got this prior knowledge, she's starting from a point much further ahead than she was previously. So, oh, 100%. And we see her manipulate I, that portal in Remake. It's like, she never did anything like that in 7. No. Not a no, thing. No, no, no. Definitely not. No. I, I agree. And I think one of the things that is so strange to me, because even in the, in the book, and one of the things that I sort of was like, that's weird that you're saying that now yeah. but she says to tifa that she like can't do 
that anymore. Yes. She can't. She doesn't connect to the planet in that way anymore. Uh, in the way that she mentions in the in her past flashbacks or whatever you want to call yeah. them. Um, but the other thing that came more across in like the Ultimania Plus is, is that Aerith and in Japanese dialogue of like the Aerith uh, bedroom scene yeah. in uh, HQ is that the way that that dialogue is written is is that Aerith doesn't really understand anymore why she's even doing what she's doing anymore. Like why she needs to change things yeah. has been lost along the way of her trying to change it because the whispers steal Stole memories. Those memories and, yeah. and it seems more apparent at the end of remake that she has forgotten fucking everything. Well, look at and the intermission so trailer as well, when she's walking down and she's like, oh, I don't feel good. Like, that's, I, I, I. that's the tip off to me yeah. where it's like, there's a severing of like yeah. how much she knows now. And she's not getting as much as she did before. And it seems way more like Aerith that we know from the OG yeah. rather than the other way around. And then the question so is, think, is that because Sephiroth's done with her? Or is that because the planet's done with her? Because of I what think it has done? everything to do with some, some aspect of, well, I will say that I think the only person who now knows what is happening at any given time is Sephiroth. Yeah. I think that's what I would sort of, that's where my brain goes. Is yeah, that he's winning at the person, minute. He's definitely right, winning. He's, he has way more of a connection to the story. I think this is one of the most like underrated aspects of it is, is that it's about giving the villain the upper hand. Yes. Rather than the party. So a lot of people are seeing like the new fate as being oh this is going to work out to the party's benefit i genuinely think that this is a comp this is a fuck up yeah or could potentially lead to they've the been sold a lie fuck. yeah they've been sold right. a lie they've done exactly what sephiroth wanted them to do they've literally right. just gone oh sorry what was that that you wanted us to do master oh yes thank you thank you all oh, right yeah 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 don't yeah, worry yeah. about that i'm just going to take over this now consequences <laughs> yeah <laughs> he needs to worry about that not you don't worry about it yeah. i've got a big sword <laughs> Right. Top shit so, up. Yeah. No. It's it's a funny thing that the that direction of Final Fantasy Seven. It's it's gonna be interesting to see what happens. Right. For sure. Now I feel like we're going quite deep here. So before we do, I'm gonna drag you back from the precipice and we're gonna do one sure. next question, which is throughout the compilation, loads of different music. And this is you know, like I was saying about the character one being one of the horrible questions. This is the yeah. other one. So, in the entire compilation, is there a piece of music that stands out to you more than any others? Horrible question, and I love it. <laughs> I, I hate to say it, but one of the things that I get... So, I get a lot out of it musically. Like, I enjoy listening to it, yeah. and I enjoy it from a, like, theory perspective, like a lore perspective. I think uh, The Promised Land or Cycle of Souls is... The one that I can say for certain is the one I go back to the most yeah. to listen to, like when I write or do anything like that, and also study and look at because the the Latin lyrics are really yeah. like vital. I think I think it's actually more vital than people understand because they pick up on it in remake, but then there's more to it than just that moment there. Um, other than just nodding to AC, it's like we're trying to. Yeah tell you that yeah, there's, there's a message here. Reason that this is playing yep. rather than it just being you know just there to, to be like advent children yeah. oh yeah this is what we're doing now Ooh, have, a, bel have a building like, yeah exactly like seriously it is crazy like, though how that entire end scene that like that fight with sephiroth and all of everything that goes on there it is advent children 100 percent. absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. insane and it's referenced as such yeah in uh in the, I think the material Ultimania, the fight AC, uh, Sephiroth and Cloud fight, yep. or battle, is how that whole sequence is supposed to be perceived as. So, and obviously, like with the one winged angel and all this other stuff, yeah, which is also super interesting. I love that. I love that creative decision. And yeah. I know. I think maybe a lot of people were really upset by it, but I think looking back on it with the knowledge that I have now from looking at the game, I. I have come to really enjoy all of the steps taken at the end to sort of lead into a new well this is narrative. It. it's like they've tied a bit of everything from the compilation into remake and then done this right. is new yeah exactly. we're going to explore all experience. of this stuff and it's going to be you know it's all still going to be there we're still going to see it throughout remake but this is new now this is not 
your expectations mean shit. <laughs> right. Yeah, you need to. Yeah, you need to sort of go in it like knowing that you're going to be walking on eggshells. Yeah. You know, like things are things are going to change a little bit. I don't think that, like, for instance, like in part two, like the Midgar Zalem is going anywhere. I think that <laughs> they they they're going to keep to that. Yeah. But, you know, those kinds of beats. Yeah. I think you've got to see uh, a, you've got to see a snake on a spike. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Right. And you're probably going to see Sephiroth do that shit, which would be funny as hell. To just see him like zooming around, like Superman being like tying up the Zalem and then just <laughs> letting his. Head I can't wait for the flashback, like, the calm flashback. Like that's gonna be, I think, the selling point. I think if we get a trailer, that's the moment that they're probably gonna nod to, and it's like everyone just shit. sitting down in the end. Yeah. Oh. Dude, that, uh, just yeah, I would be down for that. Yep. Just even seeing like. Uh, the Nibelheim reactor and just like going in like the camera slowly going in and seeing like Genova like sitting there I'm just excited to see Genova again because I think you know there's a uh, this is a side note and uh, I'll uh, by the way Birth of a God is the other one that I really yes. like Good uh, man. is like my favorite <laughs> it's like it hands down like if I'm thinking about any battle theme and anything the most disappointing in my mind quite honestly as far as soundtracks are concerned I, I don't like Advent Children and I don't like crisis core all that much as yeah. far as like there's some tracks in them that are really good that i like yeah but i think consistency wise they're the most uneven yeah and i would say even like dirge of cerberus like has mm. a consistency to it yeah. i'm not saying that it's good no but, but you can yeah, yeah like the decisions that are being made are you're decent. not jumping from not brilliant good. to what no right yeah, exactly. whereas you... i can say like from the original like a hundred percent like Almost every God. song in the original is fantastic. And There's I can listen so to many that I'm looking forward right. to getting the remake treatment as well. And Birth of a God, definitely one of them. Definitely it's it's Final Fantasy VII OG right now, and then remake soundtrack right under that as far as like... Yeah. Oh, yeah, as far as like the actual soundtrack goes. Yeah, I mean, I like remake soundtrack, but the nostalgia kicks in for me, and it's like... The, no, the, I the totally classics, agree. Man, I think classics. that's why it's the second one. That's, the, that's why it's second. Yeah. I think it relies very heavily on obviously the yeah. other music there's some other unique soundtracks in there that are good but even those aren't sometimes line up very well yeah i think so um yeah birth of the god of uh, a god and then cycle of souls or promise land promise land yeah, yeah yeah no but i'm a big fan of birth of a god big big fan i no. really hope we still get that guy i want bizarro sephiroth or please bizarro, sephiroth. yeah yeah bizarro oh. just Oh, we've got just just for a second, of... I trust him. Go on. No, that was it. That was like I oh, right. him for a second. <laughs> Even if he just pops like... up and then dies, like hello. Hey. I was like, well, that's what that would look like in remake. All right, see you. See One winged frog floats over and just fucks him up. Yes, yes. Please. Oh, come that's... on. <laughs> then we'll made it. We'll make it then. Now we touched on this one a bit earlier, and it was I can't remember what we were talking about, but we definitely touched on it earlier, and I stopped you for a moment. Because mm. the next question is, what is one of the things that you hope for from Final... Or what do you hope for now from the future of Final Fantasy VII Remake? I don't know if that reminds you what you were talking about. No, I, I have an answer to the question no yeah. matter what. Uh, um, excellent. <laughs> I... Excuse me. I... Uh, I want to see the Avalanche thing fully realized. Yes. From, like, Rufus's involvement with it, with Elf... Elfie, or I say elf, I don't know, whatever. It's, uh, it's a battle character. that I gave up on many, many I years know. ago. Right, right, exactly. So, I still call Kate Sith, Kate Sith. <laughs> right, same, same, same. So, yeah, I think the whole through line narrative of that is something that I want to see so badly yeah. grow into the story. And I think only because it's not anything that has been done both before yep. there's this isn't a recap it's got of so much potential before. as well yeah it's it's literally a part of the compilation Wutai, Avalanche, Shinra. oh right it's things set up that never got the payoff yes that we could see and now this is the time for that payoff and there's just both like if you're talking about like the original game yeah uh like there's a lot to look forward to yeah um, but this brings so much weight to the narrative that people don't see coming that I think it would be like things like if there's one thing that people look back on 
for remake, they could look at that narrative and be like, this was a solid contribution to this story that well, wasn't there before. Well, it fleshes out I the think. world so much as well, because yeah. I mean, this, like Wutai, such a minuscule part of the original game, but the, the sheer amount of potential that it's got, because all these people are still there. You've still got, they are still sort of resisting against Shimra, but not really. Then you factor in yeah. all the Avalanche stuff and the Before Crisis stuff and the Rufus stuff, because that guy has got his finger in all of the pies and he's doing whatever he wants to the pies. And it would be really interesting to see how that pans out. And yes, I, yes, whatever he wants yeah. to the pies. <laughs> exactly. Whatever he wants to the pies is like my favorite thing I've heard. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Just American that, pie flashbacks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, the, the, you brought up this. I think one of the things that I love about it is that Remake did a really good job of framing a particular narrative yeah. too, where... It's about how does one individual change the course of X, Y, and Z? And the constant question of like, okay, well, not everybody in Shinra is bad, good and evil. Like there, it, this is a huge, vague sort of uh, representation yeah. of like, I guess, yeah, that sort of whole sort of moral quandary. The gray areas. Like, yeah, the gray yeah. area. But I see it more after doing like this memory research I see it as a representation of like the live stream, yeah, so to speak, right? And I've said this before, but like with new context, I'm sort of bringing it up again. Yeah. This is that the idea of like good and evil choosing, and then the flow of like what ultimately happens when a group of people is attached to a corporation that is in control of something dire to the planet. Yeah. Like, how do you correct that flow? You know what I mean? How do you stop? the flow of this going from the beginning to what it will ultimately be, which is bad times. A, a bad, a bad end. Bad times. And <laughs> in this instance, it grows though. I think narratively into the next game, not to, because Midgar isn't, and Shinra isn't the only thing that has that sort of power over that narrative yes and i think as the game goes on it's going to be a battle of wills right it's like and this is why i think elf is important to sort of exploring this concept and wutai is important rufus is important and like just in general avalanche maybe even the turks are important yep. is, is that it's about avalanche is an easier example is yeah, that yeah. in avalanche you have fajito elf and then rufus all with different goals trying to control the flow of what this becomes. Yeah. But as we know uh, from Remake is, is that it actually splits off into different yeah, groups. Yeah, it's shattered at this point. Yeah. Uh, like individual groups of people. Um, and I think that's sort of, again, a representation of the live stream is, is that these separate wills sort of create their own narratives. Yes. So in this particular instance going into the next game i think it's going to be important to see that it's like it's a battle of whose will is more powerful and more like uh i guess who's going to make those decisions that like ultimately make me come out on top yeah right and that i think is going to reflect the battle that Aerith and Cl and sephiroth and cloud are, and zach probably yeah are going to be having <laughs> like the larger game and if i sound like i'm speaking in like riddles here it's just it's i'm i'm at this point in like the video and having done all this research that i'm so i'm speaking in ultimaniums or ultimate <laughs> what i'm saying ultimanias in in like in factual statements yeah and like without explaining myself but it's just because this is now where i i see the game going yeah. and to try and recap all of that would be a fucking nightmare and take more <laughs> more than a couple more hours so uh oh, we can do no <laughs> yeah oh, let's go into it instead you're right but i think that's how they're gonna frame everything from yeah. this point forward is is that how these systems are controlled who's in control of them how do they control them and what is their ultimate goal and they don't have to be separate Right, like for instance, Wu Tai is an easy example of things that they've already set up. Yep. Is is that Godo has his own obvious way of running things. He's in prison now, 
Yuffie doesn't have the truth of exactly what happened at like that narrative because Sonan's like, you don't really know what the fuck you're talking about. Yeah. And you just see him through the way that people are telling you to see him. It sounds like. So like even Wu Tai has like multiple threads trying to control what that narrative is even, it's gonna be which is really the same thing interesting we were as well. It's going to be interesting when we get, because I think obviously like in the original game, Yuffie's a side character and Wu Tai is a side area. I, I think we're going to be forced to go to Wu-Tai now, 100%. Oh, 100%. And it's going to be 100%. framed as, like, Yuffie's... Because previously, Yuffie's mission was she was out trying to gather materia for Wu-Tai, wasn't it? Whereas now I think it's going to be more, I need to get back to Wu-Tai, I need to see what's going on with my dad and what's going on with my country. And I think right. that's going to tie into what the party need to do as well because Shinra will obviously be involved in that in some way. And... By proxy, I suppose Avalanche are going to be involved in it. So I can see there's a couple of hot spots on the world map. Like Fort Condor is one of them. Wu Tai is definitely another one of them. I'm trying to think. There's it's... such a direct. There's such a direct narrative with, yeah. like, especially like this next part. Like Coral is going to be a place for that because there's the Mako Reactor Barrett side story. All of oh, that is going to somehow play into that. that. I cannot it's, it's... wait. Right. So, and then you also have Junon, which is another place that we can get like some more dumps of like, this is where like the president was shot, all that stuff. Yes. And oh, then yeah. Coast I always Coast forget Coast. about that. Always I know, it's forget crazy. about it. This is my one, if you, you asked me before, what one thing I want to see in Remake is, is, is that when we go and see the Turks gathered in like their little, little like poker game or whatever, yes. at the bar or whatever yes. I want them talking about the last time they were here and talking about when that whole fajito debacle came up yes it's just like a slight into like the mindset of what their characters were doing yeah. it's like what they were doing reno was there and we know that reno is there during the just OG to just to, and, and i know it is canon but just to canonize it so to speak because most people yeah. don't know about it because they never experienced right. it so just bring exactly. it in make it con just confirm it just do it and they do just they they do that a little bit in in remake already yeah but i just Keep the ball rolling. I just want to see that and be like, eh, I know what they're talking about there. Like, that's, neat. <laughs> that's cute. Thanks. You did everything for me, and that's what I want. Just all of the stuff I just want. Just send them over a gift basket. Or Kataze a gift basket. Yeah. Here's here's that check. <laughs> for a dollar. Thank you, Kataze. He's like, don't mention it. Don't don't speak to me again. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah. We're cutting off contact now. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go make another video. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Uh, so, oh, this is it now. We're getting into the big one, mate. <laughs> We're getting into the big question. I, I, I'm half expecting you to just give me a one-liner and just stop. <laughs> just to yeah, subvert yeah. expectations. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what this is all about. This is what about, it's right? all about. Well, I mean, this is it. It's like, I think for me, the big thing that I hope for from this is that it just makes sense. Like, as long as it makes sense, I'll get on board with it. I don't care what happens, as long as it makes sense and it's compelling. I like, I think tell me the story. Enough, yeah. I think there's enough there narratively that they've constructed and consistency yeah. through the compilation as far as like where the approach to the narrative started and yeah. where it ended up being in Crisis Core, where I feel confident in that. Yeah. I feel confident in the choices that they made to build the world. And I feel like it's just something that they've been thinking about for such a long time that, and it oh, yeah. feels like that. It feels like this idea has existed. It doesn't feel like a modern take to the game. It feels very odd. It's an evolution. But I think yeah. Thought through. And I think that's what gives me some comfort with the system of how all of this works. Yeah. Um, so I, I think. But I agree, like, ultimately, like, having it all make sense and having it all being, even if it's not, like... Exactly what we want, ultimate. yeah, yeah. This is right. it. I mean, I have things that I would personally want from the narrative, but if it makes sense and it's good, I don't care. <laughs> Do right. you know what I mean? Just tell me that story. Give me exactly. that story. Please do. Yeah, I'm the same <laughs> way. Just oh. as long as it, it, it doesn't have to be so forward about it either. I, yeah. I don't need that either if i have to do some digging i'm okay with that too more than half it more yeah. that's that's half of the fun like seriously the amount of like things that i've learned about the compilation in the process of making these videos and things like that 
Like, I, I wouldn't have learned half of the stuff that I've picked up recently if it wasn't for making content about it. So, yeah, I love it. I'm love the same it. way, 100%. And I wouldn't have ever known about, like, Before Crisis or anything exactly. like that. And I think it's so weird to think that, like, a mobile game could have, like, such a bigger impact on this. It ne has never made me want something more yeah. than to just have something included into the original than before. It's unfortunate that it just ended up coming out before Final Fantasy VII OG. Like, I feel like that was, like, could have been such a vital, I think, uh, the way people could have seen OG if that story had kind of carried along into yes. uh, the narrative of the original game, I think would have been only, like, a benefit. Yeah. And it's so weird to think about that because everything else... And the that fact that it's have, never been anywhere but on mobile phones in Japan. Something right. that it's, potentially it's influential is just... I almost feel like they could get away with more because it was just such an isolated thing. Maybe. And it's just like, maybe it wouldn't have come out the way that it did if, you know... But I, who knows? Who knows? We'll it's get like it. It is going to be like it's going to be folded into Ever Crisis, so at least we're going to get to experience it in some. I don't know, fair right. <laughs> yeah, all, that's me folding it up. But right this is it. At least we get it in some way. Like I've, I've, I've read the synopsis of everything that goes on. I've, I've still not brought myself around to watching it. There's a thing, um, an RPG Maker version of it, isn't there? Someone's remade the game in RPG Maker and need to grab it and play it, but I kind of want to just hold on Forever Crisis now, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think I would probably be the best bet, if yeah. I'm going to be honest. You if it, would, if that didn't exist, it. yeah, if mm. that didn't exist, then yeah, but... I, I'll be honest, I had no interest in playing, like, the other version of it. I just, a lot of, to me, when I go and do, like, this research... Like, I want to see exactly what I need to see yeah. and not, like, some other version of it. Yeah, like, not a representation of it, exactly. I think if if I was maybe a little bit less of, like, a content view, like, I'm looking at this from the lens of, like, content creation slash yeah. research, like, homework, like, maybe. But I think it would almost... You want the most accurate depiction. Yeah. yeah. I, I So watching the... Watching I suppose the, it comes down to the translation thing that we were talking about earlier, you know, like where the person's lens that they translate that material through can affect the translation. It could be a right. similar thing with this remake. Not to say that it is or anything like that. It could be a, it could be one for one perfect. Sure. But there's that risk. Yeah. yeah. And that's, again, uh, just what you're always going to get into with translation and stuff like that, which is unfortunate. But there's something about just me wanting to see the game as it is back when it was made yes. as it was like it's the same thing with like texture mods or something like that and i was like i don't want to it was one of the reasons why i didn't want to like modify my original game too much the, yeah. when i was playing through it the final fantasy 7 is that i just wanted everything to be the way that it was intended Perfect, to be yeah. like i'm not gonna um, lie i've changed everything visually about the game except for the character models i just love the little character models the old yeah, ones like, I, I i think the weird like sooner mods does phenomenal work let's just put that out there right now sooner mods and the entire team god tier work but i don't know I, yeah. I just don't like the high definition character models i think if i had played the game to death yeah and i had seen everything that i thought there was to see about the game I would a hundred percent go mod back the shit out and of it, yeah. mod the fuck out of it, right? So, <laughs> if that's how that's gonna be, like, and I I'm okay with doing that, then a hundred percent for my own enjoyment, yeah. I'm gonna do that. But if I'm not doing it for enjoyment and I am looking for, because if it's research based, game, yeah, 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 there's textures in the original game that I have found to be like Important. beneficial to my un understanding yeah. of like the rest of the games, so. I can't unless it's yeah. like the AI upscaling thing, which I is like okay, I oh. want to see these more clearly yes. because they're fucking. It is beautiful as well. Like I've got it installed on a like I've never played it on PC before. I've only ever played it on consoles. So as soon as like I saw that there was all the upscaled backgrounds, you know, the um, pre-rendered backgrounds, I was like, oh well, that's it. I'm buying it on sure. PC now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I was the, I was exactly the same way. Yeah. So. I was like, this just looks really good. Um, <laughs> it is. It's amazing work. And I'm looking forward to giving the... Because the, is it Echo S that he's working on at the minute, which is the fully voiced version with all the yes. ambient sound effects. An insane amount of work. Like, his devotion. I, I need to get him on for an episode of this, 100%. Absolutely. I'm going to reach and out to him soon, I think. 
Yeah, I, I was actually going to say, and like, just because I, I think that came out uh, recently. Is it out now? I saw him post something about beta testing, I think it was, the other day. I think that's what it might be. Yeah, but he yeah. He was telling me about it in chat that it was coming out very soon, and that was a, a bit ago. So it would be a, a good follow-up. It looks you know? good. It looks so good. Now, yeah, the work is insane. We are going to jump into the final question, Mr. Sleepy, is it? Oh, my God. Oh, we made it. Uh, it's only taken. Yeah, here. Two hours and 15 minutes. We're actually not as bad as I thought we were going to be, to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, well I mean, I know that we could keep going, but oh, we've a, done a good job. There's an hour in this question, maybe, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> it's, been, it's been fun so far, So, and it's very easy, and I think we talked about it before, very easy to get caught up in like oh, a lot God. of ideas. I so. think it's a thing, especially theory crafters as well, because we will send each other off on tangents. 100%. It's so easy to just like you've triggered me on two or three so far today. It's yeah. not even funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel the same way. It's like, oh man, there's a lot to say about that. It's beautiful. I love it. But this is the big one. So I'm not going to pin you into a box and say I want you to tell me what's going on with Zach or what's going on with Rufus or anything like that. But what I want is a prediction from you about the narrative of Final Fantasy VII Remake going forwards that you're confident about. Uh, something, obviously, don't spoil your latest video or anything, but something you're confident is going to happen in the narrative of Final Fantasy VII Remake. And once we get part two, I'm coming back around to all of you and telling you you're all liars. So don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just one. Or four, whatever. Um, Do you think? <laughs> I, I will say, like, more, because I'm sort of still coming to my own conclusions about, like, some of the video that I'm making. Yes. Um, it's hard for me to say. And I'm not saying that because I'm trying to keep a secret. No. It's more of the fact that I feel like I've put myself in a position where I kind of have to rethink a lot of the things that I was... It's still in the open. ...experiencing or expecting to see. Yeah. I think the easy bet and the things that I tend to enjoy the most was like Avalanche, and I can see that obviously playing a bigger role in the story as a side thing. But as far yeah. as like the... I think just my, my understanding of like Cloud... Uh, Sephiroth and, and Aerith specifically, it has sort of begun to like change completely, especially with like how that yeah. exists in Zach. I think maybe this is the way this uh, I'll, I'll say as a prediction, and this is a, maybe a little bit broader than you were no, go for maybe it. imagining, <laughs> but uh, as an answer. If it's no good, I'll just ask again. <laughs> yeah, just, just just cut this out. I'll just no, I'll just, just take us down a tangent. I'll just Very force it. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, the, uh, I think all of the major players of the game, as far as like Sephiroth, yeah. Aerith and Zach, I think a lot of people associate the memories of them with Cloud's character. I think they, their consciousness themselves exists inside of Cloud. Right. Like Zach's consciousness, Aerith's consciousness and Sephiroth's consciousness. I think that's probably going to be the answer to why there's such a huge stake in what Cloud decides Yeah, is because he is sort of like, rather than good versus evil being represented by like Aerith and Sephiroth, right? Where it's she within represents Cloud. the live stream yeah. and like Sephiroth represents the evil side. Cloud represents all of the things that exist in between. I think he literally represents all of the sort of battles the thematic structure of final fantasy 7 inside of him quite lit literally yeah so his decisions and how he goes forward is in into the story and the decisions he makes are what change things uh but i think that maybe what's happening maybe what's happening is that i think what what sephiroth's approach here is it's not necessarily the approach of like, okay, I'm just going to get meteor and activate. I'm going to do the same thing. Activate. Yeah. That isn't it. Yeah. I think it has a much bigger stake in controlling cloud. And I think what Sephiroth needs cloud to do is to sever the, the, these separate uh, ties to him. So he needs to sever Aerith's tie to cloud. He needs yeah. to sever Zach's tie with cloud. And I think he actually already did that 
to a degree with which is why Zach is now off yep. on his own doing his own thing is is that Sephiroth has derailed him from being cloud part of Cloud's existence. Yeah. Right. And I know it sounds like a vague concept of consciousness. No, no. This is what my video is about. So just <laughs> fucking We get crazy, man. We get crazy. Yeah. yeah. So I think <laughs> Sephiroth has already sort of solidified himself yep. inside of Cloud as a much more dominant figure. Oh. Solidify, in solidified himself. himself inside of Cloud. Come on. <laughs> you know, like the pies. Oh. Uh, yeah, but I think that's what he's working towards. I think he's yeah. working towards... Stripping all of this away from Cloud. Right, so yeah. that he sort of has... I think this is why he offers uh, like a, a friendship at yeah. the end, is, is that what... Sephiroth ultimately wants is to be able to completely control the uh, the outcome of what Cloud decides, even though he's fucking with him now because he rejected him, and he says, "Okay, well, since you've rejected me, like let's see let's what kind play. of decision you make." <laughs> but he does not want that to happen. No. He does not want Cloud to be able to decide anything that he wants to choose. So this is why he's gone at him so early, so hard as well. Yeah, because like in the original game, I mean, in the original game, he doesn't even know he exists until the boat. Right. He does not even know Cloud. I mean, he probably does know he exists, but you know what I mean? He's not thinking about him. He's not right, interacting right. with him in any way, shape, or form. There's just nothing. Whereas Remake, within half an hour, bam, oi, come here, Cloud. What are we doing? Yeah, and what are we What are we trying to do here? Yeah. I think that actually is the... That was the setup, I think. And yeah. I think people missed that a lot. Oh, well, I did. <laughs> is that the... Uh, it needs the, a replay to properly notice that, I think. Right, and I agree, yeah. and I think also just like a playthrough of the original and and remake to yes. agree, which is that the that first scene, and I'll, I'll say this as sort of like a setup to like why I think this way is is that um, in the first scene in the Mako reactor bombing mission with Barrett and, and yep. Avalanche, when Cloud puts the bomb there in the original, there's a voice that talks to Cloud, and it's like this isn't yep. just no no ordinary reactor. That is Cloud speaking to himself yep. from another place inside of his mind in remake it's sephiroth's feather and yep. then in the next time where that happens in Aerith's church it is also sephiroth sort of cutting in and intervening and being like i am like com i am your everything yep. sort of like imposing himself onto the basic like the most core part of who cloud is and it's a similar so, thing to at the edge of creation when he stops him from having that memory right. yeah exactly and I actually think the symbolism there of the sword being knocked out of Cloud's hand is yeah. also him sort of signifying, like, you're not, like, I'm speaking to you. I'm not speaking to the legacy of the other people that, like, you're involved with, like, Zack. Like, I think the, the sword represents, like, the struggle. Zack tied to Cloud yeah. and him knocking him out of his hand, right, is sort of his way of just, like, I'm just speaking to you right yeah, now. Yeah, this is like, now, you are alone with me right, right now. Yeah, exactly. And that's what he wants. He just wants to keep pushing that. And obviously that was his goal in like every other aspect yep. of his interactions with Cloud is to just separate him through like these terrible negative emotions. Because yeah, what he's telling him, run away, run right. away, leave. Well, and that in itself is like the whole thing with that is that that's his mother's dying words. So it's just like, what is, so, and that's, that scene, I would recommend anybody if you want to like have like a, and this is one of my favorite things to do narratively, is, is that you set up your story and the rest of what it's going to be about in the first scenes. Yeah. And I think chapter two, the dialogue between Sephiroth and Cloud and the way that he implies the importance of like the memories yeah. and the negative emotions that Cloud, Cloud is feeling and that those are vital to Sephiroth, not only in Chapter 2, but we well, know that Chapter yeah. 2 Sephiroth is also a connect connected to the Sephiroth that we see in the Edge of Creation as well. So, like, all of that dialogue means something very important to this now, you know, more powerful Sephiroth. But it yeah. also works into the Orde Sephiroth. So, yeah. like, it's something that continues to be vital to him. It's so weird because say, it informs so much, but at the same time, it informs so little. Right. Well, yeah. to me, I think it definitely 
informs the intent yes. of Sephiroth. And I think it in, informs the intent of some of the actions. I think that there's, from my perspective, and this is just yeah, yeah. me being, and maybe going off into the theory zone a little bit, is, is that I think that there was a vital part of Sephiroth that he needed at that point in the story. And I think the, yeah. sig the big signifier is him talking to himself in the way, referring to himself in the way that he does, yeah. which is very interesting. I think that I think people may may have underplayed that. I might have underplayed it. I should have said that. Is is that I think I underplayed the significance of that moving forward in the story because that is it is a substantial that change that, uh, that can't be for nothing. Different. Yeah, right. It's not going to be a nothing thing that they've just oh they're just interchangeable. It doesn't. It's not going to be something like that. Now what will fuck with me is that if we switch back. <laughs> Oh, fuck if no. they just go back to the Watashi <laughs> Sephiroth, and then you're just like, fuck my life, this is it. So like, then, I don't know. Could that not be that? I mean, we've got it's this possibility. We've we've got this possibility that we've got an Aerith from the future that communicated with Cloud via the resolution scene. What if this Sephiroth that we've been seeing in Remake is the Sephiroth in Remake, and the Sephiroth that we see in the Edge of Creation is similar to this Aerith that we see in the resolution scene? And the both future representations of each of these characters, and therefore Sephiroth has taken his individuality back at this stage, and that's right. why he communes in that manner. It's just it's it's so. This is what I mean. It gives you so much to work with and so little at the same time. It's really annoying. <laughs> I think, and that's if you. Excuse me. If you no? take that. <laughs> sort of approach like i think that was one of the things looking back on edge of creation sort of looking at it, the way that i sort of perceive it now is, is that you have to take into account the the timing of the event yep. the intent of getting there and then also the way that sephiroth refers to himself yeah so in that regard i would say that from what i understand of it now is, is that that is a memory yeah of of something that has happened already in in the the grand scheme of things yeah, so when yeah. you talk about memories of the future for instance we're talking about something that has already decidedly happened yeah that you are looking well, this back is it. On if it exists memory. well this is it if it exists in the live stream as part of the memories and the live stream itself kind of doesn't adhere to time as a structure so to speak yes. then th there's no barrier to this existing do you know what i mean it can I think, happen yeah I think if you look at it from that perspective, and this is always the thing that sort of troubled me, is is that memories, uh, and and to put it now simply, I think yeah. from from my perspective is memories make up the life stream, but they are also the thing that can be used to change yes. destiny to to an extent. This is that the memories not only make up the life stream power. itself, the flow of the light, the will of the life stream. And then individually, that's what we become, are these individual strands of yeah. memories. But in Remake, we see several examples of memories defying like time and space itself. Yeah. So that in itself sort of gives you an inclination to look at memories as the function in which time is being messed with. Yeah. And this is how characters are interacting with that. And that evolves into the idea of like consciousness, who is in control of those. And how are they in control of those? As well as um, when we talk about the, the edge of creation scene in particular, there's a lot of evidence to say from not only dialogue from like the creators to say like that this vision, which yeah. lines up with a couple other ways that uh, they have referred to memories that people are seeing, like visions of things that happen later, Yes, is that the edge of creation scene is a memory that Sephiroth wants to show Cloud to sort of solidify some sort of statement that he's making to Cloud. Right. And he wants to do that from the beginning. His, his goal is to show Cloud the edge of creation and show him the fate of the world. So that moment is what Sephiroth is ultimately trying yeah. to accomplish. Um, and in that aspect, the memory, the flashback is another signifier that yeah. this has already happened because Cloud is remembering something based off of the environment, which is how the memories are triggered. Uh, and in that's like why Sephiroth stops him. Yeah, 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 right, exactly. So, and then the way that he talks about himself, yeah. which is another thing. So, like every single moment sort of adds up to how you can see the story more moving forward, just from the way that you, if you understand the memory concept, if you understand why Sephiroth is different.
because that final shot of it as well with cloud just stood on his own just right. kind of locking into stood. the expanse yeah. 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 yeah yeah it's good it's a very good interesting direction i think yeah. and i think again going back to just how we've been talking about this game so far is that they have done a very good job of structuring this to to matter eventually yeah. i think a lot of the and visual the stuff that they've done as well, like with that scene and things like that. I mean, one of the big ones recently for me has been at the end of Intermission when you've got that storm rolling into calm just as the party are getting there. And I just rewatched that. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, oh, shit, that's it's so, so ominous. Promoting. I can't yeah. remember who it was that said it, but someone said it. it's like a Stephen King movie. I think it was Ray. I think yeah, it was potentially so, Ray. That's so that's so crazy because that's I, I wouldn't put it in that particular uh, frame of mind but you're absolutely right yeah it, that's exactly how it feels it's just so it ominous so and i feel like the conversation like you were saying with sephiroth and cloud it definitely gives off that same ominous vibe like sephiroth's comfortable sephiroth's getting what he wants and he knows what he's doing and i worry for my boy cloud i really do i worry for him <laughs> I, I want yeah well i think that's i think that's what's ultimately going to be the focus of the game is just like how this character overcomes this emotional weight that is being yeah. kind of cast onto him. So I, I think that I worry for him too. I think that they're <laughs> definitely setting up for more for him fine. to experience. And yeah, he's just got to <laughs> come out of it at the other end with something solid. So I hope, I hope that they just handle it well. Yeah. That's pretty much all we can hope for. But I think that they've done an incredible job. Yeah, so far, yeah, so far, there's not any major reasons for concern. I, I mean, obviously, some people have got issues with the game, but in general, there's nothing, there's nothing that's screaming to me that this is going to be a dumpster fire. I, I accept the potential that it could be, but there's nothing that's indicating that to me at the minute. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, yeah, it's 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 definitely going to be interesting seeing the journey that we end up going on now over the next. Eight years? Several hundred years. <laughs> yeah. We'll be as old as fucking Red 13 by the time. Oh, this, God. Uh, I'll be happy if I make it that long. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll, they'll figure out something. We need, we need an alien to, game. we need an alien to crash land on the planet so we can get some testing going on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That always works out. No drama. So that is the end of the question. So how was it for you? I loved it. Uh, I haven't been able to, talk about uh a lot of remake slash seven stuff for a while in a sort of a open yeah. dialogue form so i uh and i've also just been a really big fan of like all the work that you've been doing over here so this was the <laughs> right way to like get that seal broken again and Love like kind of get back into this stuff in a more fun fun lighthearted way well this is, this is a casual conversation which is funny to me like about final fantasy 7 but i enjoy it immensely yeah. so I mean, this is it. That's what it should all be about, having fun with it. I mean, everyone gets... I think people get a bit too stressed out, of, you know, about the direction the game's going in and things like that. Sure. People... People... They kind of over... I can't think of the word, but they just I overdo it's it. It's just so inter in integrated into, like, yeah. how people feel about a lot of other things. Yeah. And I think, even for me having done as much research as i've done i think maybe in certain instances i've had my moments where i get oh, like really caught up in it and definitely very, like, weird about certain things it's being able to uh, recognize it though i think that's the thing yeah. like you recognize it and you go oh shit i'll stop that yeah exactly <laughs> and i definitely have had those moments where i was like what the fuck was i doing i must have been in like a mood or something it's most but of my I, life <laughs> yeah i can't second it but the i think going forward and i, I haven't really done that too too often recently i think it's just about enjoying yourself finding the good in something and taking the good away and yeah. not making just the one thing don't over catastrophize that's it don't yeah, don't, no, don't make yeah. a big deal out of something that's Stop. yeah it's, it's also just a it's game fun. and yeah it's it's enjoyable and i like a lot of it even some of the trash parts so yeah. like I, and this is it if it's their vision yeah. as well. Like we can just all we can do is have faith in their vision. I am interested to see what they have to say about it. I think maybe one of the biggest concerns that I have is having it be a focus vision. That's yeah. what I want. I want a focus vision of what this end should be. I don't want it yeah. to feel like 
a billion people stuck their hands in the yes. story. Yes, and it's and just a garbled mess. Lost. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is I it as well. Like one of so. the big things is like this is going to be the end of Final Fantasy VII. Like once we've done with remake, that's it. Seven's done. Yeah. And I think it should be because you know there needs to be a closure to that story. I definitely think that if they're going to do anything, it needs to conclude th- this particular arc of like all of the ideas introduced yeah. in the compilation, all of the things that you got to bring it see. together now. Oh, gee. Yeah, it's yeah, and that's what I, I think, think they're that doing. Was, that that is and um, the memory concept definitely helps with that. Yeah, yeah, because like you say, it plays into the meta as well. Because we're not only dealing with the memories of the characters and the memories of like you know the, the history of the game world, but we're dealing with our memories of the game and our memories of the narrative. And I like the way, in some ways, that remake challenged those beliefs that we had of the original game and some of the things that we thought we knew, but we actually don't really know. And I'm right. looking forward to more of that. Definitely yeah. looking forward to more of that. I, I'm interested to see how much they lean into this concept of like, because it if if this is sort of a way of going and re like, there's a statement in the very first Ultimania, the yeah. first page, and it says a reunion with your memories, and I think that statement has come up to me, yeah, more so than ever, like as I've been doing research, and I think. It is about remembering. It's also about accepting the fact that at some point this ends. Yes. And that once it's over, it's over. And I think that. Are they coming for you again? Are they coming for you again? Yeah, they are coming for me. This is the (laughs) second time this week. It's the second time I've been on. It's the second time I've been on camera with you. (laughs) I know. It just keeps happening. There's something about me. Some. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. They're really tracking. They're trying to get to you. Um, yeah, that that connection to the the media, I think, yeah. would be the best way to sort of guide the narrative. Is like your experience, your vision of it, also ties into like the negative sides of that, which is yeah. experiencing these moments for the last time, and then also creating that stake in yes. the player. And once it's all over, just knowing that we're cutting it off. Yeah, you know, it does add another layer of intensity, intensity to it. It definitely does. Yeah, and if they keep that up, I think is what makes the game interesting. I think literally the stakes can be raised by knowing that this is it. This is the last last time this game gets revisited or this time gets revisited. Or (laughs) maybe that applies somehow to the concept of like what they're planning to do with like this disconnect from destiny is that your choices now don't continue. Like maybe you don't live on after this. Maybe this is it. Maybe we're going into a dead end. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe the live stream dies and there is no Aerith to save, you know, Holy, you know, or save the planet after Holy Fist. Omega pops up and just starts yeeting everything. That's right. Laser beams, Godzilla comes out, it's this whole... i just got yeah. visions of, like, Mecha Sephiroth right. versus Omega and... I, I, no, that no, actually no. sounds sick. No, sick. no, 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 no. no. I'm deleting that. that, I'm cutting yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Like a cyber Akuma thing, I can see that working out for. But it's got to be really low budget, like those old shows from oh, yeah, the eighties yeah, yeah. in Japan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like cardboard slash like foam, like cutout, like thing that wraps around his head. <laughs> it's got like some knobs from like some blender, like pieces of a blender stuck in the side to make it look like this thing. <laughs> the roof off a house for his shoulder pads. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> that would be great. I would be down. I'd be super oh. down. With that. Why do these videos always end with something so random? I don't know. There's <laughs> something about I can tell you that I, I'm. It's a, it goes both ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not oh, just you. No, I love it. A... I love it. Uh, so, how were the questions? Were they all right? No, I loved no. it. Love the it. whole thing was great. I, well, I literally, literally can't say anything else other than I just thoroughly enjoyed myself. Well, I want you to say one more thing and let people know what you've got coming up in like the coming few weeks. So by the time that we're we're coming out, I yeah. think I will have a video coming out. Uh, the next video, which is, I don't know what it's going to be called as of right now, but yeah. a, like a, a discussion of a new reunion, sort of. Uh, it, it's a long video that I can't describe how much i hate how long these videos are still oh uh, it's gonna be a long one uh, it, is it longer than this one so far yeah <laughs> maybe yeah <laughs> maybe. i knew it i knew it <laughs> we'll see. 
uh, the bullet point version of it I, is longer than most of them have been. So I'm a little freaked out, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> That's coming out. And then also, uh, I will have some other videos coming down the pipeline as well yeah. as I'm sure uh, when Final Fantasy VII Remake news, you'll be seeing a lot more of me as that yes. starts to trickle out. Well, this should uh, this video should drop just before TGS, so you never know. We might get lucky and get something at TGS and have a swathe of SEAL Team 7s to talk about it. There will, yeah, exactly. We'll definitely be talking about anything uh, remake Relevant. that yeah. will be coming out <laughs> according to my 10 sources that can't be disclosed dun, dun, dun. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> that, that hasn't happened recently <laughs> oh no, i love it i love it but yeah all of the links to sleep easy's channels his youtube his twitter his twitch all going to be in the description below it's all hovering about just underneath him now as well but i just want to say it has been a massive pleasure having you on thank you so much for coming on to do this like, like i say i thought we were going to end up in the four or five hour territory i think we've been quite well behaved two, two hours yeah, and 40 minutes we were both very much on top of ourselves we've done good like. we've done good yeah we've done good and also it was a pleasure to, to be on and oh, again no. i can't speak enough for the, like just all of the all of these episodes that have come out recently and i've been a, just a massive fan and it's lovely to see people getting to know like people that i talk to on a daily basis yeah. is always fun to see and i think more people are interested in seeing the, that sort of behind the scenes yeah. with people that they enjoy their content for so yeah it's a different a it's like a peep behind the curtain so to speak yeah it? yeah it's brilliant and, and it's, i think it's more like you were saying it's more casual and more relaxed yeah well and that's i think that's what the service that you're providing for somebody like <laughs> me on the other yeah. end of this so it's it's in, intensely gratifying to to be a, like a part of a conversation like this and to see other people talking like this too so yeah thank you no no thank you for coming on and like believe me subscribe we will be doing it again to the channel subscribe, subscribe to all of the channels to sector six's channel but i'm hoping that like by the time video yeah i'm hoping to hit a thousand just based on this video like only about 400 subs away it'll be fine no pressure totally totally works <laughs> out you heard him people but get no, to work all the links Man, great content click all of the things all the bells all the subscriptions for me for sleepy just for everyone yeah just just match just match Mesh. like that and it'll be fine yes. uh but no thank you very much for watching and keep an eye out for the next episode of the big seven but from me thanks very much and have a great day bye everybody <laughs> love it and bye from mookie as well <laughs>